welcome to my coverage of Steven Universe Season 1, episode by episode. I'm going to be formatting things with some summary, primarily pointing out details relating to the writing that show how Steven Universe consistently interweaves character arcs and world building with good lessons for kids. This is part of a series to make the positive case for Steven Universe, since universally, discourse has been really muddied and filled with lies for years. I'll reiterate, as I have before, I'm not a longtime fan. I did not grow up with Steven Universe. If you wish to see a debunk of some of the biggest and worst videos defaming the show, you can click the playlist above or on my channel. If you want more context on my personal perspective, please consider clicking the prelude segment to this one. Without further ado, let's just dive right in. Season 1. There has been a lot of misinformation or blatant leaving out of important details in order to form narratives not present in the show itself. Let's start setting the record straight. It'll be a little more detailed on the front end. We're going to see a lot more descriptions with individual episodes since we're establishing a lot of important things that will be elaborated on later. But hopefully you'll see that things speed up as we go along. I mean, we do have like 50 episodes to run through. Episode 1 is the Cookie Cat episode, and I'll be real, this is one of my least favorite episodes as an introduction. If nothing else, though, it shows how far that he comes by the end of future. We see Lars reluctantly doing work, Sadie empathizing with Steven and trying to keep order, and Steven crying over his cookie cats. We get our first characterization of the Crystal Gems as well, from their contribution and fighting. Pearl is gentle and concerned, spinning to fight and mentioning her wanting to avoid hurting anyone, Garnet is blunt and insightful with her fighting style and mention of where to find the queen monster, and Amethyst is laid back and slobbish, snappily taking out the monsters and picking her nose. This is doubled down, finding out that the gems got Steven cookie cats. Garnet had the idea to get them since they were going out of production, Amethyst stole as many as she could, and Pearl went back to pay for them. Intelligence, spontaneity, and concern. This also lets the viewer know the immediate role that caretaking takes over Steven, and the happiness he feels over this care causes his first show of power that quickly starts to fade as he anxiously tries to capitalize on the moment and summon the weapon for the first time. This lets the viewer know that Steven's powers are at least somewhat dictated by strong emotions and emotional control, showing that his power will be proportional to his emotional maturity and understanding, just not quite in the way that he or the audience understands. The gems try to help in this scenario where it started the first time, with them comforting him over still being loved even though he hasn't figured out his strengths or powers yet. This positive affirmation and his emotional high spawns his weapon, a shield, marking clear that while Steven may be somewhat useless now and be coddled and kept safe by the other gems, his role is to eventually return the favor and defend them back too. The mother bug shows up, and Steven, being a dumb kid, is overconfident. He interjects himself into the fight, assuming the cookie cat is what made the power come out. He tried to help to no avail, and after having the mini fridge get busted, instead of hiding away or preserving hope to fix it, he realizes its electricity can be used to throw at the monster, electrocuting them and saving the day. This is the last aspect that will develop the important dynamic of Steven Universe's early episodes. That is, Steven's childlike grasp on his ability, his overconfidence and overcompensation over his lack of useful abilities. But like with the fridge, it's meant to show that he can still surprise people even being as perceptively useless of a kid as he is. The overcompensation and the guilt, mixed with a lack of self-awareness and overconfidence, is what characterizes the initial Steven we see. Episode 2 shows that while Amethyst takes things easy and seems like a slacker, even driving home how similar her and Steven are with the part about the fry bits, she immediately grabs Steven and goes to get Garnet when she sees that something she perceives as a genuine threat arrives. It goes to show that while Amethyst is carefree, she's not a wholly apathetic or uncaring character. She can still get serious when she needs to, something that will be a focus of a future episode with Steven as well. We meet Greg in this episode, who the show paints in a fairly pathetic light, not immediately recognizing Steven, holding the waffle iron as a weapon, and living in a van. There's actually a really endearing scene of Greg reminiscing as Steven goes through his storage shed, and we get some Rose-themed items as well as our first picture of Steven's mom, as well as the confirmation that Rose, who is Steven's mom, gave up her physical form to bring Steven into the world, in a way, dying to make him live. The wording is strange and doesn't confirm how exactly or what exactly made Steven, which is another mystery the show is laying out. 
The light cannon initially fails to work. Again, Steven is trying to tell the cannon it's okay and that it's not useless, which is projection of his own feelings, not being able to operate it as Rose, since he's not Rose and he can't do the things that she could do. When Steven repeats the hot dog mantra that basically comes down to it's okay to not be perfect, sometimes you can make mistakes, you don't have to let that define you, and sometimes good can still come from the good intention, this emotional sentiment turns the Rose Cannon on and they work together to hold the cannon still and save Beach City. Episode 3 lays out explicitly this time that Steven feels undervalued due to his inability to use his gym and how he wants to prove to the other gyms that he has something to offer too, this time through a backpack that can store things. The gyms debate on him coming, but eventually decide to let him come, where he crucially fails to bring the one thing that he was meant to, but in the process also prepares three other items that help secure safety on the trip. Steven shows guilt in the episode for his failure, but Amethyst cheers him up. We see later that he still feels guilty over this mess up. Episode 4 deals with Steven's loneliness, being largely excluded from gym activities. Creating a together breakfast, he states, is too good to eat alone. At this point, you're probably starting to see a pattern. Steven's insecurity and issues of self-worth drive him to want to change, but his childlike earnestness betrays a lot of the effectiveness of his good intentions. On top of that, Steven has a hard time reconciling that his earnest good deeds may not just be unneeded, but unwanted, which leaves him feeling useless. To avoid this feeling of uselessness, good intentions often evolve into self-denial and overconfidence as a defense mechanism, as he is painfully aware of his abilities that underperform what is expected of a gym, but his attempts to fix it often cause more problems or take people down a more chaotic route, sometimes leaving people worse off than before, somewhat better or uncertain, and sometimes actually pulling through. This consistent aspect is his childlike earnestness, and I think that it's what some people find cringy and grating. It's a very common trait among children who are neglected. His pitiful overcompensating nature guards his insecurity, and the overconfidence helps the illusion from being shattered. With episode 2, we saw Steven's earnestness save the day. In episode 3, we saw him do quite a few useful things for an overall failure. And in episode 4, we see the most negative outcome of where his earnestness leads him. I've seen some people say that this is Steven just being selfish and actively ignoring what others want for what he wants, but this strikes me as a particularly flat reading because, as I already outlined, there's a lot of layers to why he's doing this. Does his earnestness have a tendency to turn into bullheadedness? Yes. But it comes out of a guarding of his insecurity and feeling of loneliness, uselessness, not out of any sort of selfishness or malice. And what even is this selfish thing he desires? It's to be loved and cared for, to be useful to people. Not exactly supervillain material, but again, pitiable. And for some viewers, something that I can see being off-putting, even just as a defensive reaction if they see some past part of themselves in him. Like when you're laying awake at night and you think about some cringy thing you did multiple years ago. This episode, for world building's sake, also introduces the gym room, although that is left mostly unexplained other than it seems to have monsters held in bubbles and bubbles hold gyms. Lastly, Steven does apologize at the end for his behavior, and they end up deciding to get pizza instead of eating the together breakfast, again driving home that it was never about the idea of eating a particular thing, but of quality time that he wants to spend with the people that he loves. Episode 5 is the first Beach City episode, coming from many of the same staff as Adventure Time. It was clear a similar sort of structure was planned. With many episodes being about various lives and arcs of Beach City characters, sort of slowly changing and reaching their own heights throughout the story, while the actual mysteries had drops of info scattered along the way. This has become all but the standard in most current cartoons, from Adventure Time to Gravity Falls to The Owl House, and heck, even Rick and Morty. This seemingly episodic nature with small building points to major plot beats has almost become a given in storytelling for cartoons in the present day, so, so I'm sort of surprised when Steven Universe gets uniquely criticized for this. Some people floating the ridiculous idea that you have to pick episodic or serialized storytelling, as I debunked in the Lily Orchard response, and the ridiculous concept that you can't mix the two ideas. 
This is wrong even on the outside of modern cartoons, as the fantasy genre in particular has been doing this for ages, with cornerstone defining works of fantasy like The Hobbit being essentially a collection of short stories mostly disconnected but with an overall plot, and with the more plot-heavy Lord of the Rings still involving sections like with Tom Bombadil, which were cut from the theatrical versions due to them being so easily sliced out of the story. Steven Universe, already establishing itself as a show that is centered around positive lessons of emotional understanding for children, and focusing on the importance of understanding our emotions, as hinted by Steven's gem power, makes sense that there would be a separate section for human characters with human problems for Steven to work through and understand, even as he fumbles his way through them. Him coming to better understand other people, their issues and their problems, allows him to become a better crystal gem, allows him to help people better. The metaphor is pretty clear. The presence of these human episodes are also critically important to emphasize Steven Universe's themes and concepts later on, but we'll be coming back to that many times as it becomes relevant. Petey's episode is about valuing childlike wonder and not taking it for granted. Petey wants his dad to be impressed with him, so he takes up a job that he hates. Once Steven liberates him from that job and they get to do childlike things again, like riding the mechanical seahorse he always loved, then there's a hole left inside. He says... You work away your life, and what does it get you? Cash. Cash that can't buy what the job takes. Not if you ride every seahorse in the world. Steven acts reckless and dumb in this episode, not taking anything super seriously and seemingly missing the point that Petey tries to make. He, in all of his flaws and reckless ignorance, is happy, even as he risks his life and embarrassment to fix things. He is unperturbed. Episode 6 starts finally giving some more positive attributes to Amethyst as opposed to Pearl. Well, so far Pearl has been characterized as an organized and concerned person, and Amethyst has been slobbish and lazy, here we see as Pearl's organization goes to an unhealthily stifling degree, where she's often finding fun or exploratory activities to be frivolous and without point, and Amethyst being someone more open to exploring and creativity, to learning and observing more parts of the world that don't seem immediately necessary. We also know it takes decent effort to transform well, and as it is later emphasized more, transforming for long periods of time or frequently is a fairly straining thing to do. Introducing this aspect of transformation right now ends up being set up for multiple plot beats later. This sort of shows that Amethyst is not just able to get serious when she needs, like in previous episodes, but that she is willing to expend more than the usual effort and energy in pursuit of new things that she finds personally interesting. This dynamic is also exemplified by Amethyst enjoying the texture and feel of unique foods, eating even though she has no biological function or organs. While Pearl despises food and sees the consumption as gross and pointless, Amethyst's creativity leads Steven to explore his abilities in a more comfortable environment. Something that we see in Steven's eventual cat selves and transformation is that the cats operate outside of his own free will. He didn't just adjust his form into a cat, he turned part of himself into real living cats. This inconsistency with what we've seen of Amethyst's form changes hints towards something that we'll see later as we learn of Steven's gym power and of Rose's having the ability to give life and heal. It's actually foreshadowing characterization for Rose that we haven't yet seen. Episode 7 introduces Connie. It also shows Steven in his most positive light so far. His thoughtless earnestness leads him to sacrifice himself to try and help Connie from a falling rock which ignites his emotionally driven protective abilities, keeping them safe in the bubble. From here, Steven focuses on trying to get them out of the bubble, while still trying to make sure that Connie isn't uncomfortable or worried. Even as they get sent underwater, Steven, clearly distressed, tries to play things off as less severe and tries to keep her calm. Once the situation becomes too hopeless to seem otherwise or pretend things are fine, Steven finally listens to Connie's concern and talks personally with her to calm her down. We learn, while Steven thought Connie looked cool and collected, that she was actually friendless, due to traveling a lot for her dad's work, and in a controlling family, not being able to enjoy junk food or the normal hobbies that kids do, mostly studying and reading to make her parents happy. Once she thinks that she's about to die, she states her regret of not having done anything with her life, and the fear of dying with only her parents to mourn her loss. When the bubble pops, rather than panicking like Steven might be when predisposed with the gyms, he immediately puts that aside and helps Connie get to the surface, then also using his brains to tie up the monster and defeat it without using any powers. In a lot of ways, this can be seen as the completion of Steven's first initial character arc. He provides for himself and protects someone, 
but maintains his thoughtless earnestness, acting first to help instead of freezing to think. All of Stephen's traits that sometimes lead to mixed or chaotic results are working in harmony here, and in exchange, the excitement also sparks something in Connie outside of the paint-by-numbers life. He affirms that even without powers, he has something to offer. Something that is, again, a good lesson for kids, who, similarly, probably don't have powers, at least not in the way that we see the Crystal Gems. Episode 8, we get a first glimpse at the view of the battleground of Earth versus Homeworld, although we aren't given specific context. If Episode 7 was the culmination of all of Steven's traits for good, this episode exemplifies his ignorant earnestness for the worse showing that his trust that the gems will always be there to protect and save him leads him to inherently take these situations less seriously. We know now that Steven can, in fact, solve problems on his own, doing so in Frybo, Cat Steven, and best of all, Bubble Buddies, but this harks on to his own insecurity as a gem, and his need for affirmation causes him to hurt and make things more difficult for the lives of the gems that he cares about so much. During Steven's realization and regret, he reflects and is rewarded by the show by finding the solution to escape the puzzle box. A positive lesson for kids that, even if you mess up, you can still help fix things by admitting to your mistakes. Notably as well, some of the murals in the background here also foreshadow things about Homeworld and the gems. Episode 9 starts with an argument between the gems, where Amethyst recklessly messed up and Pearl is upset to a degree not warranted. Garnet lectures Amethyst, which Pearl takes as her being on her side, but it's clear Garnet does not think Pearl's in the right either, just simply less wrong. The three of them, in their distraction, neglect Stephen for the entire day, which does better at emphasizing how the gems sometimes neglect Stephen whenever it comes to their activities. The overall episode deals with, again, Pearl, and to a small extent Garnet's, tendency to categorize what a crystal gem is, eventually coming to an understanding to accept Amethyst's creative outlets with the help of Steven getting through to them. Episode 10 introduces Lion into the story, and mainly just serves to further cement how each of the characters normally act, building a repertoire of the sort of normal dynamic of the gems, now that we've seen them in all varying aspects of their extremes, either highlighting flaws or complementary traits. It also has this classic line. We kept Amethyst. Episode 11 does mostly the same as the previous episode characterization-wise, although it does point out a rare scenario where Pearl and Amethyst actually agree on something, showing how even though they may seem different, their differences can still lead them to similar conclusions. Pearl not enjoying the game, not getting the point of following what she sees as a counterproductive and time-wasting rule, and Amethyst not enjoying the games due to not wanting to play by the rules. Garnet, of all people, becomes extremely entranced by the rhythm game, which we can see now is likely due to it testing her future sight ability in quick, limited ways, in a way that she doesn't often get to do in a non-stressful environment. It's one of the first times she can actually use her ability for something fun. It's also the first time we see her third eye, and does well to characterize her distractible and fun-loving nature that has been previously muted. Ruby and Sapphire love doing things together, and feeling each other in harmony. Ruby is hot-headed and eccentric, more prone to fun, being closer to pink in color. Sapphire is more thoughtful and calm, seeing the future and being motherly. Most of the time, this combines as a slightly dry-witted care for Steven and dutifulness for the other gems. But here we see the way that the Ruby part of her character can sometimes wrap her up in menial situations for the pure enjoyment of being in the moment together. Steven, at this point, doesn't know that Garnet is a fusion, but it's fun to see how they play with this split nuanced aspects of her character so early on. It also emphasizes how integral Garnet's power is to the gym's ability to work together, and interestingly ends with Steven being punished by the arcade owner despite the issues arriving largely due to Garnet. This helps flesh out that it isn't just Steven who brings down the gems all the time, but instead more of a mutual relationship, with Steven taking the dive for the gems' misunderstandings on Earth, just like the gems take the dive for Steven's misunderstanding and inability to do different gym activities. It goes to show that the relationship is mutual, which I think is important for building empathy for both of them going forward. Episode 12 is the official fusion introduction, Giant Woman, which centers around conflicting personality traits of Amethyst and Pearl as Steven insists that they get along so that he can see what their fusion actually looks like. Interestingly to note, Steven actually mentions a single time with a line change that if it were him, he would want to be a giant woman, in reference to the fusing, which makes sense as when Steven does finally fuse for the first time, the self-projected relationship leans more femme-presenting. 
This episode follows a lot of Pearl and Amethyst getting along, by virtue of them both not wanting to fuse, with some more of Amethyst's reasoning, saying, hey, the Heaven Beetle won't show up if you keep squawking at me. It shows how Pearl is very aggressive and disrespectful of Amethyst, even when she hasn't necessarily done anything wrong or made a mistake, which feeds Amethyst's defiance because she doesn't want Pearl to feel rewarded in her treatment of her. Once Steven gets eaten and Opal is fused, at first one might think that it leans more on Pearl's side of things. But on other hints in the episode as well, when they unfuse, it seems Opal combines the preciseness of Pearl with the creativity of Amethyst, then highlights the way that both Pearl and Amethyst try too often to show off and look cool, with Pearl's side of the personality doing backflips and Amethyst's side spawning the bow and arrow. Pearl and Amethyst are both similar in that they both are ones to get absorbed in a moment, but when Amethyst realizes that she's distracted, she is calm about it, while Pearl immediately panics. This is what causes them to get so distracted in their fusion that they forget the Heaven Beetle, which breaks the fusion. It's a good emphasis of all the things that Pearl and Amethyst seem to have in common for once, that rarely overlap. Opal is that overlap. Episode 13 is based on the added lore that the gems are essentially eternal. They are created, then exist until they get hurt and die. They don't age or degrade like organic life. This episode emphasizes the cultural disconnect between the gems and Steven. While Steven, in his short life, has come accustomed and understands the human world, Pearl and the others still don't grasp human concepts and jokes easily, even after thousands of years. Something that becomes a bit of a subtle running joke with Pearl, since she tries to act like she understands humans and jokes, while still clearly, consistently, enjoying something outside of the actual point. This is a running joke that we see even all the way up to Steven Universe Future, as Cam's Camshafts, a commercial, is Pearl's favorite song on the radio. After Steven faces a number of failures in trying to get the gems to celebrate their continued life, he starts to self-reflect on his own mortality, causing his childlike view of different stages of life to literally age him to those levels. This is another case of Steven's ability being tied to emotions, and more so the idea that mortality, healing, life, and death. This also importantly shows Steven's first instance of form changing, showing his powers are getting stronger, and also showing that what Amethyst was able to do in the earlier episode may somewhat be applicable to him. As we know, this power will also play into a future episode that's important for his character arc. Episode 14 sets up more explicitly Rose's power to give life and her care of organic life on the Earth, dealing with Rose's healing garden. We also get further characterization of Lars, not just being a mouthy slacker, but actually someone deeply invested in being accepted and approved of by people that he perceives as cool. The irony is that the cool kids find Lars's obviously fake cool guy routine to be rude and not really the vibe, while really liking Steven instead as someone who's unapologetically himself. This is a good lesson for kids, obviously. Lars is too embarrassed by Steven to fess up and face the music, though, and ends up guiding them into the moss at Steven's protest. Steven and Lars drive the car into the sunlight. Steven takes the bow and lets Lars get all the credit, despite Lars complaining and resisting the whole way. And the cool kids in Lars's mind finally accept and are happy with something he did. There's a weird idea that early Steven is incredibly selfish because of the things like demanding fry bits or insisting everyone eat the together breakfast with him. Well, I already explained how the Together Breakfast stuff is far more complicated than that. I hope that this drives home that even in early Steven Universe, where Steven is more obnoxious and childish, that he's still prone to a consistent pattern of wanting to help and make everyone happy. Sometimes, completely avoiding credit for the good that he does to help out his friends. Any way you cut it, him giving Lars a hand, when Lars didn't do much to deserve it, shows the length that Steven goes, not just to do whatever will benefit himself in the moment, but to help his friends whenever he sees that it's important to them. He doesn't even perceive his bowing out as a sacrifice, as he's unabashedly happy to see Lars be accepted. It's honestly ridiculous how many great lessons there are in this episode, and also how much this actively builds on the world building. We get a better understanding of Rose's powers of life, as well as some more context about who she was, and what she found value in on the Earth, as well as understanding lessons about being yourself and not faking so that other people accept you. Beyond that, we also have that sometimes if you want somebody to become better or be accepted, you have to step out of the spotlight. It's just, it's amazing how many messages are just in 10 minutes here. Episode 15 sets up Onion, more so than his short cameo in Bubble Buddies did. 
Onion is established as the mostly mute kid who generally does bad things for the sake of it. Some later speculation is that this has to do with a rocky home life, but essentially, Onion does anything bad that he feels like, generally without any malice behind it. Breaking in, robbery, arson, he's a little monster. This episode centers on Steven willingly giving up a toy that mattered to him to Onion, who rarely gets to see his dad, realizing that memories are more important than mementos. The reason that Steven valued this toy was because of the memories that he had with his dad. Giving it to someone who doesn't get those memories often, and opting to spend more time with his dad instead, while they still have time together. Another selfless and not necessarily needed action done by Steven to hopefully inspire goodwill and make someone feel better who is doing worse off than him. It also has a really nice message about valuing the time that we have with people while we still have them, and that other people may not always be as lucky as we are in the experiences and the people that get to be around us. Episode 16 establishes poofing. When the gym's physical form take too much damage, they will forcibly retreat inside their core gym until they have thought out their form to return. Steven, missing Pearl, spends time fighting with her dummy, trying to do things that Pearl would do with him, and slowly realizing how much he relies on Pearl for practical and emotional support. He eventually defeats the fighter Pearl, learning sometimes there is no replacement for the things that you lose, and the importance of coming to accept things with how they are. Then Pearl recovers her body and returns from her gem. This introduction of Poofing obviously is going to be very important with a lot of world building in the future, but also will be important for the biggest upcoming step in Amethyst's character arc. Episode 17 is actually the first episode of Steven Universe I ever watched, since my housemates and I share an HBO Max account with our internet provider, and I didn't realize that other people had already watched some. It's not that important, but I genuinely think that this is a more interesting episode than the pilot, even if at the time I was missing a ton of context. This episode introduces the in-universe series Dogcopter. This episode centers on Connie and Steven wanting to go see Dogcopter in theaters and taking Lion to get there. But Lion doesn't listen well to Steven at this point in the series, and ends up taking them to Steven's mom's secret armory, doing lots of cool stuff before getting hurt and somewhat ending up at the theater. Connie says she no longer feels like seeing the movie after seeing all the cool stuff that was in Steven's armory, looking sad. Steven misses why she's sad, and is instead upset with himself, saying that he's always messing up, and that he can understand why she wouldn't want to hang out with him. But Connie states that she's been feeling similar, that she's so boring and lame compared to all this gym stuff. She doesn't feel like Dogcopter would ever be cool to Steven when he spends so much time riding magic lions and fighting alien gyms. They both nearly come to an understanding as the thing that hurt them and chased them catches up to them, and thanks to Connie's boring tennis practice lessons, she swings the sword in a way that repels the energy ball and saves them. They both swing the sword, using their combined strength, just like how Connie helped Steven figure out how to open the armory early on. It affirms their bond and subtly emphasizes the strengths of their relationship. It's a great episode, building on the internal insecurities that they feel around one another, and coming to grips with a realization that neither of them feel that way about each other. They enjoy the movie together, and that's it. The episode is good at reinforcing the early parts of Connie and Steven's relationship, and answering the what-do-they-see-in-each-other question. And it makes perfect sense, as they complement each other's traits and weaknesses. Connie being organized and seeking freedom, and Steven being curious and seeking discovery. Connie is smart and intuitive, and Steven is chaotic and adventurous. This is also probably the most explicitly we have Steven's insecurity laid out in terms of how he feels about his relationship with the gems. But in this case, it's being applied to Connie instead of the gems. Episode 18, Steven acts as a mediator between the Crystal Gems and the residents of Beach City, following the gems destroying some of Kofi's pizza shop in the Corrupted Gem Attack. By the way, please support me on Kofi, if you haven't already. Uh, kisses. The Crystal Gems don't feel like they need to apologize, since they've protected everyone from certain death on the regular, and some collateral damage is expected, and the pizza family don't understand what they are being protected from, but reasonably have to operate in society, unlike the gyms, meaning they still have to make money and secure livelihoods for their children and their future family, to keep eating and living comfortably. The episode gets at more generally what Steven Universe focuses on a ton, which is the idea of waiting, listening, understanding, trying to get to know and see the perspective of people who are different from you. Episode 19 deals with Steven's feelings of neglect, uselessness, and loneliness again. He gets a special discount to hang out with the gyms, but they ditch him for a mission. Once he finds something to do by himself, they come back and force his attention on them, not realizing that he was doing his own thing. 
It paints the relationship where they assume Steven is always biting at their heels for attention and involvement to the point where they don't actually respect or let Steven grow out of that. The gym activates Rose's door for the first time, and he goes in to get some alone time. It creates a nightmare version of Beach City where everything is a ghost of itself. It shows Steven the value of everyone living their own lives, and things not always revolving around him, how he's not the main character of life. How shallow and empty it would feel if people just spawned from whatever Steven expects of them. Eventually, the whole world collapses on itself as it fails to render something so big as Beach City for the power of Rose's room, and he wishes to leave to see the real gems. The gems apologize also for not respecting his wishes and assuming what he wants instead of considering him as his own person. And Steven states that he realizes the world is actually a better place, more full place, when he doesn't get what he wants all the time. That the freedom people have to be themselves allows for the greatest parts of life, that those things are what constitute life. Then they hang out and do golf, both being free. And Steven ends the episode joking that he always gets what he wants, which is in stark contrast to the actual lesson. This is one of those things that has been used as a soundbite, as Steven being a self-centered jerk. Now you can see in context how bad faith of a criticism and manipulative this is when it's used, and you can pretty much dismiss on hat anybody who's stupid enough to use this. It's a soundbite that comes from Steven as a self-aware joke after he spent the episode learning the value of his occasional loneliness and the freedom that others have to include or exclude him in things. A humbling bit of maturity that a world where he is sometimes told no and things don't go the way he wants, or a world where other people disrespect and hurt him, is better than a cold reality where everything just goes along with what he wants. The joke is a goofy ending to the episode's exact opposite moral lesson. So anyone using it to emphasize Steven is selfish isn't just missing the point, but going out of their way to... I mean, I, this, isn't, this goes beyond bad media literacy. They just have to be lying at that point. Episode 20 is a return, on the other half established in Giant Woman. In Giant Woman, we saw a fusion that rarely happened due to the characters of Pearl and Amethyst being too toxic to get along with each other, both taking forever to fuse and defusing at the slightest disagreement. In this episode, we see a fusion that works fine as separate people, but when the traits fuse, they become toxic together. Garnet suggests her and Amethyst fuse Sugalite, since Sugalite is a very powerful fusion, in order to destroy a gem communication tower that is trying to re-establish itself. Pearl is off-put by the idea and asks to be fused instead, saying that they need to be precise, and Garnet disagreeing. Pearl, clearly jealous, shields Steven from the transformation, and after their recklessness accidentally puts Steven in danger, Pearl returns home, leaving the task to them since, in her mind, they apparently don't need her. Steven, being amazed and impressed at just how big and strong Sugalite is, gets pumped up to be strong himself. Pearl tries to say that there are different types of strength, but Steven says, yeah, but I want to be strong in the real way, causing Pearl to go inside and do chores, folding things, while singing more about her own insecurity. Fusion with Garnet is seen as a moment to really shine. Fusion reinforces the strength of relationships, and we see Amethyst and Pearl both have issues with being rejected, as Amethyst is later in the episode. Generally, we see that Pearl enjoys her order, strategy, and precision. She is very effective at accurately hitting a target, efficiently analyzing a situation, but while she does like doing this, these strengths are off-put by her lack of raw physical strength. Amethyst is the exact same in the opposite sense. She has poor precision, but has a lot of raw strength. Tends to be more clumsy, but more effective in the hits that she gets. Garnet all the while, while we may not know in context of the show yet, is already a successful combination of this order and chaos. Ruby is chaos, hit first, think later, and Sapphire is the cool-headed and strategic, literally having future sight. So it's a dream whenever Pearl and Amethyst fuse with Garnet, because it's like they have a place where they belong already. However, it also causes one of them fusing with Garnet to make the fusion somewhat lopsided, in Pearl or Amethyst's favor, which is why a lot more personality of Amethyst and Pearl come out in Sugalite and Sardonyx's fusion. But Opal is more reserved and balanced, at least for how long they can hold it together, and why Alexandrite also tends to be more balanced. The song exemplifies the way that Amethyst and Pearl are actually similar again, but while Amethyst tends to take things out on other things, Pearl tends to retreat inside of herself. 
They are both extremely insecure and seek validation in Garnet, whose strength is a symbol of what they fight for. Although, again, we don't learn that Garnet is a fusion herself until the end of Season 1. Sugalite comes back and insists that they stay fused, since Sugalite, like all fusions, isn't just a combination of different gems, but a whole new gem made of the positive and negative traits of the individual ones making her up. This also will set up the idea of toxic fusions for later in the season. Steven takes his role inspiring Pearl to play to her strengths and not give in to her hopelessness. Pearl then uses her precise organization to make the landscape work in her favor, exploiting the distractibility of Amethyst and the ruby part of the fusion to her advantage. This episode is probably one of the big four in terms of popular criticism, and it mainly has to do with how people interpret the coding of involved characters. People criticize the episode as racially coded, in where a dainty white woman uses her brains to subdue the violent black woman. While there is certainly a racist historic precedent for this sort of characterization, I think a lot of the time this interpretation excludes many significant factors of the show in order to fit a square peg into a round hole, so to speak. Firstly, this episode is often used to push the conspiracy that Rebecca Sugar specifically is some type of secret racist. As show creator, they are top of the iceberg. However, it's unreasonable to attack Rebecca's character as if the most malicious interpretation of everything in the show was their personal idea. The writing and storyboarding team of Steven Universe is one of the most diverse in cartoon history. Should we automatically assume the worst faith interpretation and ignore all the non-racialized explanations given in the show itself? What was Rebecca's involvement with the episode? Generally, if they had a hand on writing it, then they show up as a storyboarder or supervising director. But there are a number of episodes, especially in Season 1, that Rebecca Sugar didn't work on directly, except in extremely minor ways. Looking at opening cards, Rebecca didn't write or storyboard this episode and is not credited at all. Instead, the supervising director of the episode, aka the person who overlooked the episode, was instead their partner, Ian Jones Cordy. Yeah, it's certainly a pretty yucky way to see the episode, but acting like Rebecca Sugar is some secret bigot who doesn't understand black people and that that is why this coding exists, something that is actively malicious, is unabashedly and belligerently bad faith. On a show that pushed diversity and inclusion, a lot of this criticism starts to stink of right-wing co-opting of progressive language without understanding context and sentiment in order to have a gotcha moment. Considering a lot of videos pushing this also include racist and homophobic jokes, as I've covered in my own series. However, just because bad faith actors co-opt criticism they don't understand doesn't mean the criticism of racialized coding even if it wasn't intentional, isn't valid criticism. But at this point, what is the worst faith reasonable explanation? That they let something slip through that could be interpreted as racist in a vague coded way on accident? This doesn't seem like the damning criticism it started out as. Another tidbit people mention is that when the gems fuse with Pearl, they become more thin and elegant, while whenever they fuse with each other, they become more monstrous. That this is also a racialized message by the show, but... This seems to fall apart when one has context for fusion, and also when one considers that Amethyst has no definitive coding, and that this interpretation requires her to be black-coded in order to feed into the racism narrative. It should be said that gems are intentionally abstract from their racialized human counterparts. Their color designs are based on how their personalities work in regards to color as a spectrum, as I covered in the Prelude segment, or the last part of the series. Check it out if you haven't. This spectrum of the human psyche, a lot of the time, makes the characters feel coded by however you read the voice as. The logic goes, Pearl sounds white and is largely white-colored, so she must be white-coded. However, she's actually voice-acted by an Asian woman. Garnet is voiced by a famous black singer, Estelle, and has something resembling an afro, so she's black-coded. Amethyst, however, has been subjected to ceaseless arguments as to whether she's Latina, black, white, or the like, and more so, she is voiced by a Korean-American voice actress. So, this idea that Garnet X Amethyst fusion not working is somehow anti-black seems to take three to four levels of separation from nearly every level of context that you could look at in the show in order to force the argument. And even then, the argument that you're trying to make is that there was a malicious characterization of minorities made by those same minorities. It's relying on the squint your eyes and think that kind of makes sense form of reasoning, since people from within the involved racial communities also have strong arguments for and against the idea. And there is no single polarity within a single race of people that agrees on this. 
And the show is written involving people from those communities in the first place that make way more sense anyways. Specifically, this episode was supervised and directed by Ian Jones Cordy, as I mentioned, with no credit to Sugar themselves. It seems odd that these obvious holes are neglected so heavily to simplify the narrative and make it appear more damning. So the next question, I guess, is why Steven Universe, a show about pushing diversity, inclusion, and acceptance, was being specifically targeted by countless takedown videos on this specific thing? It seems to me, at least, that even if someone were to concede all the bad things being said, that it would make more sense to target more loudly the shows that do the same thing more often with less tact and who are also not led by minority communities rather than one of the only shows intentionally trying to support these communities. Especially when most of the people making the criticism show by virtue of their own comments are neither coming from these communities or are at worst actively vilifying them with homophobic and racist comments. Say there are two shops, one that sells apples and the other that sells grapes. The apple owner overhears a customer complaining about the grapes not tasting good. Does the apple owner then run a campaign pretending to be a grape fan in order to make grapes better? Or is it more likely that they stoked a flame to ensure that their business had less competition? Now, abstract from the show's given context, when it comes to racial coding, I did study it a bit in college, but I'm personally not black. Although, I have consulted with some of the people that I know in order to get their input, and in my experience, they don't side with the racism straw man. This is one of the main substantive things people use to aim at whenever targeting the show, and I think it holds up pretty weakly as criticism. Episode 21 establishes the toxic, complicated relationship Sadie and Lars have, focusing on Lars faking a back injury so that Sadie will cover up for him at work. Steven picks up the slack, and Sadie tells him how she thinks that Lars is actually a really good person, but over the course of the story that she tells, she overlooks the fact that she did far more for Lars than he did for her. She discovers that Lars lied, and so gets revenge, stating that she won't apologize as Lars asks if he can help her with work. This is really oversimplified description, of course, mainly because I'm not trying to overdo it on the summary, but instead trying to extract the abstract here. But this episode is also really funny. Sadie and Lars' relationship, where Lars seems to take advantage of Sadie's feelings, will continue transforming slowly through the series, but other than a few small appearances, this is their first major characterization together. This is important because both of them will end up being pretty major characters in the story, and the way that they develop through their toxic relationship into better people who eventually learn to live their own lives, separate from each other and in a way that supports each other, is really impactful in the long run. Episode 22 focuses on the time travel device that spins out of control as more and more Stevens go back in time to adjust smaller problems that Steven faces. By the end of an episode, the Steven that we follow destroys the time turner and kills himself along with all other Stevens in order to preserve the timeline of the original self. It's a sort of existential riff on the same message from Rose's room about it being better that reality isn't always at your whim and revolving fully around you. It's also, frankly, freaky how Steven quite literally gives up his own life to undo this mistake and takes it with a smile, kissing the Steven who was yet to pick up the timepiece on the cheek before saying goodbye forever. I have to assume something. This insane has to count somewhere extreme on the selfless meter. Giving up your own life even if you know something virtually identical but consciously different would go on living as you is at least worth a gold star or something. It terrifies me. I'm not sure if I could make that decision, even with a huge threat. Between this, Too Many Birthdays, and Rose's Room, some Steven Universe episodes verge on existential horror. Like their concept comes straight out of the Twilight Zone. But once again, we're literally being shown here how Steven is willing to die to make up for his mistakes. A ton of growth from the earlier Steven, especially because he takes it with a smile. Episode 23 establishes the corrupted gems as possibly redeemable, and mirrors Steven not giving up on it, with how Garnet perceives Rose's empathy, drawing similarities between the two, the mother and the son. This particular gem is also brought back a few times in the future when exploring the corruption cases throughout the series, and this gem is the one from the first episode, of course. Steven also gets his ability to bubble gems here whenever he says that he'll keep it safe, mirroring the pre-established sources for his power. So yeah, most of this is just generally doubling down on the message of Steven Universe to always give people or things another chance, always try to understand and figure things out before jumping to conclusions, something that's incredibly important and continuously re-emphasized throughout the series, while also vastly expanding and setting up a bunch of things in the plot and world building. 
Episode 24 starts with Connie and Steven on a picnic, while Steven hesitantly retells a recent story at Connie's insistence. The episode establishes that Steven's feeling of despair and failure over not being able to help Amethyst, while also introducing the closest things gems have to death, shattering as a concept. Through Amethyst's cracked gem, it also establishes more of Steven's complicated feelings toward his mother, stating that he doesn't know how to feel about her or who she really was, hearing her praise from the gems, but also the large amount that she failed to share with him beforehand. Then we have Rose's healing fountain, of course, which will become relevant much later. The episode awards Steven for being emotionally open with his friend Connie, as the episode ends with Steven healing Connie's vision accidentally via the juice box. It really can't be underestimated how positive a lot of these episodes are for telling kids, and especially young boys, that it's okay to work through their own feelings and be emotionally honest and open with others. This isn't some big political message, it isn't that on the nose, but the narrative and structure is continually using this classic trope of emotions being linked to powers to engage with topics of emotional maturity and openness. Even simple ones like it's okay to feel upset and it's okay to cry. It's okay to engage and share your feelings with others and that sometimes doing that can actually help you come to terms with or better understand what you're actually going through. And I know it's possible some people have maybe missed the point and thought, okay, but a lot of shows have to do with powers getting stronger from emotions. But normally it's like, oh, I'm almost defeated, I can't die, I need to protect my friends, or they get really angry and so they start punching harder or something. That's a different type of emotional power creep. Instead of linking this purely to the strength of the emotion that Steven is feeling, and instead with the emotional maturity and ability to understand and reason with his feelings, makes things into a much more nuanced and important lesson. Episode 25, The Lapis Introduction, and we're at the mid-season right now. Steven starts playing with an assumed-to-be-broken mirror, but as it starts reflecting different things, it starts piecing them back together as a recording. This is actually a really nice character detail since Lapis will become defined by artistic passion in Steven Universe Future and in Season 2 onward. Her creativity to remix and recreate ideas from her limited understanding shows dedication, but you can also see her desperation for a connection, as she is both desperate to get out and entertained to be experiencing anything other than thousands of years of unending silence. After Lapis's release, she is surprised by Steven's kindness, touched even, although she starts to wonder if he was only being kind out of ignorance. Are the Crystal Gems different than she thought whenever she first came down to Earth, or is Steven just ignorant to the situation that he's in? The answer, of course, is some of both. People cite Lapis incorrectly as some inherently manipulative character and disregard the more nuanced way that her trauma and insecurity plays into her being controlling later on. But it's good to note that before Lapis does anything major, she offers Steven to come home with her, wherever that may be. Lapis also says something that can be left to interpretation whenever she sees the gems, that implies that they're the ones who put her away. This isn't literal, of course. They were somewhat responsible in the sense that whenever she came down to Earth, people thought that she was a crystal gem when she wasn't, and so because of the crystal gem, she got put away. But this is more second-handed, which, while not entirely fair, is still what Lapis obviously blames them for. At his hesitation to return home with her, she looks genuinely heartbroken, but also being unfamiliar with her situation has to make sure that she gets things right. After all, she may not get another chance to escape, and she doesn't want to get bubbled or trapped in another mirror or anything like that. Self-preservation is her number one priority when she doesn't understand what is going on. The gems, while seeming unreasonable here, are also understandably scared of Lapis, as she is a very powerful terraforming gem, and one of the only gems they've seen in recent memory, who still has recent memory memory of Homeworld and the Crystal Gem War, and isn't somehow distorted by anything. And all they know about Lapis is that she's from Homeworld in the War era. Some people try to highlight Steven's slap at Garnet as a negative point of his character here, but I also think that this highlights the importance of the gems keeping Steven in the loop. Steven found something that seems good, and that good thing is defenseless and scared of the Crystal Gems. The Gems neither explain why they need to take the mirror from Steven, nor let him continue acting freely. They are restricting his free will and not telling him why, infantilizing him. The Gems have also shown themselves to have rash and unnuanced responses to problems before, so his actions are perfectly reasonable here, in terms of him trusting his own intuition and trying to understand the situation, him being curious and adventurous. 
Combine that with Steven being much weaker than Garnet, Steven being the one intimidated and trapped, and with Steven immediately being regretful and apologizing, I find it hard to push this as some sort of character flaw or issue with Steven as a character, or especially as an issue with the show as a whole. Episode 26 continues the plot of 25, with Water being suddenly gone from Beach City. There are a lot of character details showing Greg's responsibility, and then later showing some comfortability around Amethyst. Pearl takes the responsible role of driving as usual, while it seems everyone has switched out to sleep over the drive. Steven has been directing Lion from start to end. Pearl also drops officially that all the monsters that they fight are corrupted gems, an important detail the gems have been withholding from Steven up to this point. Beyond that, she also drops that gems fighting gems are actually not that uncommon, unfortunately. Afterwards, Lapis attacks them when they refuse to leave her alone, but Steven summons a Conqueror's Hockey-like shield, and Lapis takes him up to speak with her. Here he learns that she is trying to stretch the ocean to space in order to get back home, something she despairs is probably futile. Steven heals Lapis's gem, and she thanks him before flying away and returning the ocean. There is a lot of mystery to Lapis still at this point, other than the fact that she can apparently fly and control water. She seems good-hearted, but after thousands of years trapped in isolation, is obviously extremely desperate to get back home and to avoid being controlled again. When she leaves, despite not being malicious, it also shows her one-track mind by having the ocean falling and potentially killing everyone, seemingly not even crossing her mind. She still doesn't see most organic matter in life as anything worth considering. She doesn't even think to think how fragile it might be. Pearl and Garnet speak solemnly to each other about what it means that a gem goes back to homeworld from Earth, and how all they can do is prepare, wait, and hope it's not the worst. Since all of the things in regards to homeworld and who the crystal gems are has been kept a secret to Steven all this time, it makes sense that through Steven we would start to suspect and be curious of what exactly the crystal gems are like, since Lapis largely just seemed ignorant of Earth and didn't seem like a bad guy. Of course, with all the information that is to come, we understand the reasonability of the Crystal Gems' worry. All right, let's get to the last half of Season 1. That's right, we're halfway through. Episode 27 has a lot of small character foreshadowing details. Pearl seems insistent on Greg not staying with them, hinting at their kind of troubled relationship, and also Greg obviously being worried about Steven and this extreme situation that just happened. After Greg pretends to not be healed by Steven, Garnet quietly but knowingly looks over at Greg, saying, hmm. This is a really small detail, but knowing Garnet's future vision and Pearl's long-standing issue with Greg due to seeing him as taking Rose from her, it's cool to see this in retrospect going through the series. As I've already somewhat spoiled already, Greg fakes his leg being broken. This is actually the most negative portrayal of Greg throughout the entire series. It comes right after being exposed to a life-or-death situation, fearing for his son's safety, and being reminded of his loneliness, especially after he loses his home, the van. This lie causes Steven to lose confidence in himself, causing his healing ability to actually falter, but Greg apologizes and helps what Steven couldn't heal, and they understand each other more. Greg's loneliness and care for his son, and Steven's insecurity and affirmation. Once again, emotional honesty is rewarded, and manipulation, even one with good intentions, leads to problems. It's another good lesson for kids that you generally shouldn't lie, even if you have good intentions. Also, Greg ends up hugging Pearl for fixing the van, and she's freaked out, which is funny in retrospect. Episode 28 establishes the broken off-world warps, and the gems checking to make sure that they are still broken. Pearl seems regretful that they are broken, and Garnet is insistent that they can't be fixed. It's clear that they are concerned about Lapis leading Homeworld to make contact with them, but also clear that they are trying to keep Steven out of the loop. Steven and Greg decide that they're gonna make a spaceship, and Pearl surprisingly wants to help, seemingly yearning for the off-world. Greg and Steven eventually decide that they've lost interest in the idea of actually building the ship, because the idea was more of a front to have a father-son bonding time, but Pearl is upset and insists upon making one. In the late night, Pearl wakes up Steven with the completed ship and starts taking off. Pearl, totally lost in the launch, insists that things are going to be fine, saying that she'll return Steven in 50 years. Greg says that he'll be dead in 50 years, and Pearl shuts him off before the ship starts falling apart, and it's clear that Pearl is lost in her own denial. Steven snaps her back out of it and into reality, and they eject, with Pearl conceding that maybe Earth still is the best place for her after all. 
This episode has a lot going on. First is the clear sense of resentment and apathy towards Greg, and another is the way that Pearl still has trouble seeing Steven as his own person with agency. Character flaws wise, this opens most extremely. Pearl's flaw of having one-track mindedness and tendency to become self-absorbed in her own conclusions. Pearl acts pretty terrible in this episode, but there's also a lot to see in the episode in retrospect. Maybe getting lost in the idea of taking Rose back from Greg and being in space like they once were before the Gem War. It's delusional, and it puts the safety and happiness of our two human characters at great disregard. There's a lot of ways that someone could interpret the actions of Pearl, and sometimes people throw this out as a sort of minor callback saying Pearl tries to repeatedly kill Steven, with this being the first example in the show, and this just seems wrong to me. Whatever Pearl was thinking, it wasn't driven by murder or anger, but a longing for the past and a denial of the reality she found herself in, the past that could still be one day in her own hopes. It's about her coming to grips with loss, and the never-agains that plague her memory. She also, while having mixed feelings over Rose seemingly leaving her for Greg, and leaving reality to become Steven, it seems Pearl is still having trouble reconciling her love and resentment, similar to many of the other gems. Angry that Rose left the world without telling them, angry that she left her for Greg, and being reminded of her missing by her less-than-equal replacement but then reminding themselves Stephen didn't decide to do this. She did. And that she might have still planned something with him, or in the least that Stephen is, for one reason or another, what she wanted. Trauma and loss can cause people to not always see straight whenever they act, but I think attributing malice is a fairly bad faith interpretation of Pearl's character here. I do have some of my own issues with this episode personally, but they aren't deal breakers. I think with retrospect, the fact that we know that she would be either dead, scrapped, reused, reset, or just plain shattered on Homeworld if she returns seems ridiculous to me. Even if she managed to get past her oath of silence and somehow this weakened power Steven was pink, how would they respond? There is so much wrong with Pearl's plan, knowing what we eventually do, that it almost seems like a substantial break in character, even with the character flaws that we know her for. And while we are likely supposed to see this as a weakness through tunnel vision and believing that you're right, closing yourself off to others, that this message could have been told in a way that didn't fly so strongly against some of the logical actions that we would expect for Pearl. A character who, certainly focused and one-minded, has never shown herself to be this unreasonable. So honestly, if for story reasons someone thought this was a bad episode, I wouldn't personally argue with them. It certainly is nuanced, but the level of nuance rides the line on just being bad characterization for Pearl. And in a story-important episode like this as well, it just seems strange. In fact, this is probably one of the only episodes that I feel like has characterization issues at all. Episode 29 centers around Pearl spending time with a bubble that Rose Quartz did, again emphasizing the longing that Pearl has for Rose. When Amethyst and Steven cause it to shatter, they all make a team to try and fix the bubble and hide it from Garnet. Steven gets excited doing this because it gives Pearl and Amethyst something to do to work together on and understand one another, but after the situation mostly solves, Amethyst and Pearl want to stop the secret team behavior. Garnet then forms a second secret team with Steven to make them admit that they're wrongdoing with Steven pretending to take all the blame. But Pearl and Amethyst don't admit to their involvement. They let Steven take the fall. This is the third time the show has shown us that despite having different reasons for their actions, both Pearl and Amethyst's personalities often lead them to similar conclusions, ideas, and flaws. The episode ends with them eventually getting spooked for lying, and they all end up reaffirming that they're all on the same team, and they don't need to hide things from each other. Episode 30 starts with Steven now being able to warp on his own. I think it's clear at this point that Steven Universe is paced like a more condensed adventure time, mostly episodic character building moments with small details and bits of lore that will eventually forward the story and the lore and the things that the characters can do in the narrative. Nearly all the early episodes seamlessly work in important details that build naturally to the big climax. Introducing the broken portals, the small pieces of knowledge about Rose coming together, the slow understanding and growing of strength in Steven's abilities, it all builds with the more episodic elements generally decreasing as the series goes on, until there are more or less multiple episode-long character and plot arcs in later seasons. A good example in Season 5, for instance, is the Rose stuff with Pearl seamlessly going into the Ruby and Sapphire arc, which transitions into the final Homeworld arc. These early episodes establish norms on a nuanced basis, and slowly 
slowly build, and later on, they end up trusting in this nuanced groundwork to take the character down more nuanced paths. I mention this now since sometimes people will act like the way Steven Universe structures its character growth and its story is somehow uncommon or bad on concept. Some videos even claiming you need to pick a side whenever it comes to serialized stories or episodic ones, as I alluded to earlier. But this doesn't track at all. People love Adventure Time, and it jumps between story lore and one-off episodes even more radically than Steven Universe does. I mentioned The Hobbit while talking about Episode 5, and yeah, the structure of major cultural touchstones like The Hobbit also abide by this structure, mostly episodic content that generally arcs toward a larger ending point or ending points. A lot of anime do this too. Samurai Champloo, Trigun, Cowboy Bebop, Debatably Evangelion, Haibane Renme, Violet Evergarden, Especially with those last two shows, they have a very clear overall arc in the story that it's going for, but still use most of their early episodes just to expand character norms and world details. The first half of Haibane Renme is just episodic adventures with primary characters, sprinkling in world lore, before things start stitching together in the later half. Evangelion 2 uses the Monster of the Week angel attacks to build up character norms and plot lore details before ramping things up in the last third of the show from episode 16 onwards. Violet Evergarden is almost entirely episodic, following a new character that she meets along the way to understand the meaning of love. The criticism is embarrassingly bad, but I think it also feels intuitive to people who waited for Steven Bombs before the show was actually done, because they were invested in specific things about the major story, and wanted those things resolved or expanded in every bomb, but they were disappointed by the necessity of the fully finished show not prioritizing the short-term, but the long-term quality of the show. So, anyways, episode 30 is further characterizing Lars and Sadie's relationship. We have seen that Lars is a cruel, manipulative person with Sadie, but not out of malice, mostly out of thoughtless stupidity and insecurity, and not letting himself think of what he's doing due to these deep issues. Despite Sadie's insistence that Lars is a good person deep down, this episode is where we first actually see this. After Steven takes Sadie and Lars to an island to warp, they get stuck losing the warp pad. Everyone tries their best but fails to get food, except Lars. His bad mood slowly melts away as he gets good at catching fish and cooking. Something notable as him being a good cook is something that ends up being pretty major in future episodes that overall arc his character. It's this opening up that allows him to be a more honest version of himself. Eventually, as the time scale becomes underdetermined, Lars lets his walls down and is finally happy and smiling honestly. He has had to get out of that negative mindset that he was in in normal society and social concern to learn that he does have good things about himself, that when he applies himself, he can succeed. This is also foreshadowing for when he's taken away from Earth. It seems like just the overall social structure that Lars is put in breeds him for failure. That there are circumstances where he could really shine outside of normal society, but normal society puts him in a place that emphasizes all the worst parts of himself. This is good foreshadowing for Season 5, as it establishes that Lars, separated from social expectation and norm, tends to be a more free and happy self. Unfortunately, it turns out that Sadie actually hid the warp panel to spend more time with Lars. This came from a good place, but is horrendously manipulative and strongly paints Sadie and Lars' relationship as a mutually toxic one at this point. While Sadie often gets the short end of the stick from Lars, Sadie doesn't respect Lars' agency as a person. What redeems Sadie somewhat is when the monster attacks Lars, she jumps in the way and defeats them to save him, something also mirrored by when Lars and Steven get kidnapped, and instead of fighting the monster to protect Sadie, he runs and hides. It clearly shows that they have toxic traits, positive and negative ones, that often hurt each other in ways that are not beneficial. In a sort of opposite way of how we see Connie and Steven's different sides complementing each other, the differences between Lars and Sadie just emphasize each other's flaws. Sometimes opposites attract, but sometimes attraction doesn't mean things make positive fits. This episode, kind of sadly, ends with Lars trying to be more open and supportive of Sadie as a person, but Sadie rejecting it out of disillusionment over her own actions manipulating Lars, her feeling bad about what she did, and her hurt faith in their relationship. Since the episode seems to end with Sadie being annoyed and Lars being earnest, some people, as you might have remembered from my previous videos, have interpreted this whole episode as blaming Lars for what happened, or ultimately saying he's wrong because he's a man, rather than what actually happens. Sadie manipulates Lars to feel valued by him, then gives up on it, feeling guilt once they actually escape the monster. They both learn opposite lessons. Lars learns that it's okay to be more open with his feelings, and Sadie realizes that even if she gets what she wants through manipulation, the acts of a manipulated person aren't honest to themselves. It's, well, manipulation. 
Stephen just sort of acts as comedic, annoying positivity, so the episode doesn't get too dark. But these are all lessons that are good for kids and how they should treat their friends. Episode 31, we get an update on P.D. Fryman, seemingly coming into his own, responsibly working at the Fryman business. We also revisit Ronaldo, his older brother, who I've actually sort of glossed over so far. Basically, in the Cat episode, he expressed interest in the weird and has otherwise made minor appearances since. This is his episode, as it basically establishes him as a meta-commentary gag character. The episode centers on the idea that if it's harmless, it's okay for people to believe things that aren't real. It's not really a message I like or understand, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding it. But I guess I agree, since I wouldn't exactly break down the doors of every person I've ever lived with just to crush their worldviews. But I also think that a willingness to suspend yourself from reality can necessarily lead you to harming others through misunderstandings, and that a person should always strive to understand reality as it's the best for themselves and others. Still, I don't know. I don't really like this episode, honestly, but the fact that PD is the one who tells Steven Ronaldo will be more happy with his conspiracies and to leave him like that kind of calls back to PD's loss of childlike wonder and his respect for those like his brother who, in one form or another, can still reach out to it. Weird episode, but I suppose that was in the title. Episode 32, Fusion Cuisine. Connie's parents want to meet Steven's parents before they let her continue engaging with him as a friend. This debuts Alexandrite into the show, something said to be deeply serious and only used for important situations, and the situation they do it in is to try and present as the best mom for Steven. I think this is representative of the show's thematic priorities. In some shows, the ultimate fusion would be teased before used for a climactic final battle, but here it's for preserving a relationship that Steven finds important. The show, then, is to say, these human relationships, understanding and caring about others, is the most important part. Not some space battle or war, but the relationships that people cherish, and the worth of preserving those things. We also get a look into the harsh parenting style that Connie receives, and we have seen alluded to so far, that has made her reflexively learn to lie about small things to avoid her parents' regular charade. A prime example of this is when a parent says that they always know better and shut their kids down too often. The kid either gives up on their individuality or hides away anything that they know will be shut down. On the other side, lying still isn't the best for long-term relationships, and Steven's misunderstanding of Connie's lie as being ashamed of him is a really good example of that, while also reinforcing the ways in which Steven and Connie appreciate each other in ways that the other of them can't always see about themselves. After a disastrous dinner, Connie and Steven run away on a bus, get caught, and the Mahesha Warrens bond over the gyms lecturing Steven while clearly having a loose understanding of what would be an appropriate reaction. Still, this cruel overreaction is seen as charming by Connie's parents. This episode is fun because it plays into all the gym's interpersonal relationships, positive and negative traits, and how they gel and don't gel with each other. Calls back to the off-kilter delivery and understanding of the gyms, calls back to the misunderstood appreciation of Connie and Steven from the Lion movie episode, and caps the episode off with progression of Connie and Steven's relationship with a blush and a hug, and Mr. Mahesha Warren forcing some space between them doing pretty much the most established cartoon tell to show that Connie is starting to develop feelings of some kind for Steven. Something that will be left completely innocent through the remainder of normal Steven Universe, but once they're older, will be eventually delivered on. Episode 33 is very similar to an Adventure Time-like concept, with Steven trying to guess what Garnet was doing for the day, and is very invocative of the ways that Bimo tends to describe and explain things while obviously fitting more with Steven's interests. It helps emphasize how Steven sees some things, like interpreting Amethyst as a cool renegade samurai, but mainly emphasizes Garnet's care for Steven and nurturing of all of his eccentricities, her enjoyment of his unpredictability and childlike wonder. Episode 34, Watermelon Steven, establishes the growth of Steven's power from creating life of his own form and healing things to now healing and creating new sustaining life of its own. A continued escalation towards what we were told Rose could similarly seem to do from the Rose's Fountain episode and then also from the episode where Amethyst almost gets shattered. Eventually, the Stevens go into the sea to live by themselves, something that will come back multiple times as Steven's powers keep expanding. So again, to reiterate, 
We had this first thing established in Cat Steven that life can somewhat be created. Then it was elaborated on in the Rose's Fountain episode. And then it was elaborated on again and expanded with the Amethyst episode where he learned to heal. Then we saw his issues with learning how to heal better and worse and eventually getting a better grasp on it. And then we got to him creating life of another being. So this is like six episodes worth of setup casually put through the world building and something that will also continue setting up as Watermelon Steven ends up being being important for both the Malachite arc to come and also one of the most major moments in season five. This also has to deal with the way that he is able to replicate and communicate his consciousness with other beings, something that we'll also continue expanding upon. It's just really interesting. We're looking 34 episodes into the show now, and we're seeing how someone watching the show for the first time would probably not even recognize all the groundwork that's being laid down, but how this groundwork has seamlessly escalated into what will continue escalating through the rest of the story. It's great character progression. It's the sort of character progression that you don't even realize is happening. It's something that's so seamless, so natural, that it's not even something that most people would pick up on unless they were actively looking for it. Episode 35, we start by getting extra content that Sadie's mom apparently has a tendency to infantilize Sadie and that she doesn't like it. While this leads Steven to eating one of her lunches, the info about her mom is mainly set up as foreshadowing for Sadie's upcoming arc. This episode sets up Lion's ability to travel inside of his mane like a dimensional portal to his mom's secret stash. Here, he finds things that meant a lot to his mom, including a VHS tape labeled for him that finally introduces Steven to his mom. I like to think that while Rose is a very guarded character and always has given people different impressions of her, this message to Steven was something that she wanted to get across purely. She gave up her entire life to create Steven. The course of who he was or who he became as a person must have meant a lot to her. The fact that she was going to impart her life to become something that could change. Here she instills that the world is full of possibilities and that each life has its own unique sets of experiences and points of view. That every time he feels love, that's her loving him. And that he is becoming something innate, incredible, a human being. This is important to keep in mind with an understanding of Rose as the series gets more complicated. Rose talking about each life having their own experiences and the possibilities in retrospect can't not draw images of how Homeworld limits the lives and purposes of personalities by their gym's color, shape, and size. How when something becomes too unique or off color, they're abandoned, crushed, shattered, how the infinite possibilities of fusion are banned, only to create bigger versions of existing ones for preset purposes. Humanity represents freedom to Rose, something she herself represents to the greater Jim psyche as pink, the symbol of possibility. I think it's pretty obvious from her first appearance here that her value of living your own life, being your own person, living your own decisions, is the driving force that makes her love humanity, and ultimately what ended up making her give up her life, to create something that in her own mind could do greater than she could, that could span more gaps between people. It's also generally a good lesson to tell kids that they have value in and of themselves purely because they are alive, because they're human. It's really good to reaffirm to children that even if they feel like they're bad or have negative self-esteem or whatever, just the fact that they're alive and that they're human gives them an innate value. That's a wonderful lesson to impart to kids. Episode 36, Steven sees something warping, but none of the gyms believe him. After the gyms spend all day humoring Steven to prove that there's nothing wrong, Steven gets irritated that the gyms don't ever seem to validate or have faith in him whenever he says things, despite being correct in the past. The infantilization of Steven by the gyms as an insecurity manifests itself in stubbornness in this episode, since Steven is concerned that what he saw might be a gym or gym-like creature and be dangerous because of that. Then finally, when Steven gives up, he finds what he was trying to talk about. Steven manages to fight it off, but follows it as he learns that its goal was to help repair the warp pads. The gems locate Steven and apologize before he freezes to death, and they go to the homeworld warp. Robots are trying to repair the portal, and the robots are being led by an intelligent gem, Peridot. Peridot casually mentions restarting the kindergarten as foreshadowing, and does a log date, which makes it clear that she's on some sort of mission. But it also introduces the idea of logging for Peridot. Peridot briefly leaves, and Garnet smashes the portal as Pearl and Amethyst fear that they are coming back. 
Stephen was excited to meet a new gem and is now confused. This continues to build upon some of the Lapis arc and the idea that the Crystal Gems, secretly being a minority of gems that want to be away from the other gems, come into focus. It also does well at emphasizing how Steven's infantilization mixes with these heavy ideas of the threat of Homeworld, an episode where the main struggle is the gems not feeling that they can rely on Steven, and that the last scene being everyone upset over something that Steven doesn't know about, but they only know about because of Steven. It builds mystery while also reinforcing the flawed character dynamic for the characters to eventually bridge. Since the Watcher always follows Steven and is, too, in the dark, this leads the viewer to likely think that from Steven's perspective, what's wrong with the gems? Why do the gems I know keep so many secrets from me? Why do they pretend to want to be reunited but sabotage and hide whenever connections are made? Why do they attack first, talk later? Understanding Steven's perspective here is vital to seeing him as an asset. Steven is the only one who noticed this giant threat that the gems didn't believe, and now that the threat has actualized and been found because of him, he doesn't even know what the threat is. It's starting to seem somewhat one-sided. One criticism I saw of Steven Universe complained about is its third-person limited perspective. You either see only the protagonist, only the protagonist and outward tidbits from related close-by characters, or you allow your viewer inside the head of every character. People use this to make comparisons to Avatar, which has some great third-person episodes that center on characters and knowledge separate from the main character to build the world. Steven Universe is a mystery show, though. One of the first major shows to set a trend between gaming, cartoons, etc. that really focuses on broad-spanning world lore. And so having our titular character be given these details at the same pace we are makes it more exciting and seamless for a mystery-focused narrative structure. If we got a random Peridot episode after here and saw all the homeworld stuff and her mission and everything, it would make her far less interesting as a character. It would be a cool one-off episode, sure, but it also would retroactively ruin the catharsis of our characters experiencing these things when we do. Worst case scenario, we figure something out and then we have to wait for the characters to slowly catch up and cobble together details that we've already known and been definitely shown earlier on. Another important perspective is that this also creates a disconnect between the series' most primary characters and the plot of the show. Steven Universe is a show about people and personal struggles represented by big ideas. This mystery uses the plot as a natural event progression that coincides with Steven's character arcs throughout the series into the person that he becomes. The entire show is built around this very arc. The gems facilitate different avenues of thinking, perspectives, personalities, changing the focus to have lore drop episodes that Steven either never learns or learns later than the audience completely shifts the focus of the show into a messy short-form fulfillment. It ignores the very point that the show exists and strives for. Episode 37 starts with Steven failing to fuse despite trying to learn by dancing with the gems and failing. A small comment all the gems say is that fusion is hard for them, and Garnet just crosses her arms and says, Not for me. This is one in the many building list of small foreshadowing bits about Garnet, so I wanted to draw attention to it. Back on topic, though, there's even fear from Pearl that he may be unable to fuse since he's organic. Since he's at least part human. This idea that he may never live up to his mom because he's only half Jim causes him to talk to Connie about how it makes him feel and his doubts, while also being realistic, as it is a very well-established insecurity that Steven has had to deal with prior. I think this is also important because it shows the genius of Steven Universe's allegory. Without specifically tying itself to any direct parallel, it makes itself able to speak to many types of insecurities, whether that be basic physical differences or things they don't like, you know, let's say their nose, let's say their height, anything like that, or maybe like a mixed race type of situation, anything that sets them apart from the norm, you know, having a non-normative sexuality or gender identity, anything that makes a kid feel insecure or out of place, it's something that they can relate to here. Especially if they feel like they need to fill in the shoes of an older sibling or of their parents, it can make them feel insecure, like they're not going to live up to it because of so-and-so reason. Connie comforts Steven instead by just pointing out that she'd be too scared to even try to dance at all. That just by still trying, he's doing better than some people. And that leads to Steven, out of gratitude for her trying to cheer him up, he wants to bring her out of her shell in a way that she would be comfortable. So they dance on the beach together. 
Some people get hung up on gendered dancing roles as being racially coded when it comes to the gems, but I don't really buy it. Like Pearl playing the feminine role and Garnet normally playing the more masculine. That's not true, obviously, because during Greg and Pearl's dance in Season 3, Pearl is the more masculine one. Still. Here in the Steven and Connie dance, we see Steven twirl Connie, but when he starts to fall, it turns into her dipping him. This manages to visually show us that they are both comfortable here playing both gendered dancing roles, and that comfortability that they will be there for each other no matter what role they're called upon for to play makes them fuse. The initial scene of Stevani running their hands over themselves in shock and awe has also caused some people to claim this as a sexualization of Steven and Connie, and I think that's primarily because of a shallow reading of the episode. Stevani's design, other than looking like an adult, is very modest, with the top leaving ambiguity as to whether or not the form they've created is even male or female, and at a later point, they were confirmed to be intersex. Stevani definitely comes across in this first appearance as femme-leaning, with ultra-long hair and the exposed gym crop top, but giving an adult character hips doesn't suddenly make them sexual, and this femme appearance actually serves a narrative purpose in this specific episode. Comparing this to other Cartoon Network shows like Adventure Time, or even something not on Cartoon Network like Avatar, I'd also say this is being pretty unfairly scrutinized. Still, once this fusion happens, obviously Stevani want to show themselves off to the gems. I think Pearl's comments here can be left as they are. They're kind of funny. Uh, I don't really care how someone interprets them. I feel like it's supposed to demonstrate the established jealousy and inferiority that Pearl feels around fusion, as well as her personal want to control situations, and the fact that Pearl saw themselves as the ultimate combination with Rose, with Pink, maybe she had some sort of expectation that she would be the first one to end up fusing. Following her lines, though, the absolute joy on Garnet's face, lead to a few important lines that I think are really, really worth keeping in mind. These Garnet lines that follow are important. Garnet states that Stevani is not two people, nor one person, but an experience. Fusion is the physical representation of the abstract idea of a relationship between people, whether that be two or ten or a hundred or a million. Another argument that Stevani is sexualized, and this one strikes me as feral levels of absurd, is that Stevani is sexualized because their design is aesthetically appealing. Meaning, since the character doesn't conventionally look ugly, they want you to like how they look. And that that's inappropriate? I don't think this really dignifies a response, but it has been parroted frequently. And I think it shows a poor ability to separate sex from sex appeal. And that is more projection of the person who makes this sort of argument than anything else. I think kittens and puppies are cute, but I would probably projectile vomit if they were involved in anything sexual. I think Bimo is cute from Adventure Time, but I don't want to bang Bimo. Making a character confident in their own skin and happy with how they look is not inherently sexual, and it's not an artist's fault if you have weird feelings toward their art. At least not inherently. There is a practical and thematic reason for them being seen as appealing in context of the show, though, and that is because Stevani's body is about the same as the combined ages of Steven and Connie, so to strangers they look like they're in their mid-twenties as an adult. Them leaning more femme in this first appearance is also meant to mirror female socialization. People are creepy around girls in real life, let's just be honest. Even minors. The process of puberty can be terrifying and traumatic even if the person was as cisgender and straight as they come. Finding a way to portray this sudden realization that you're being looked at differently as a piece of meat instead of a child, that you're under threat, being leered at by complete strangers, treated differently, this can be a terrifying thing to go through for many young girls especially, partially because of the culture that normalizes sexualizing underage girls. I apologize, this is about to get dark, but I think it's needed to establish the importance of this specific representation that is being gone for in this episode. While reporting may not be accurate due to increased stigma and socialization of the silence of young boys, our current data indicates that of the children under 18 who suffered a sexual crime, 82% were female. There are currently 41 U.S. states that allow for child marriage with the consent of a guardian. For 20 states, there is no minimum age requirement. This is legal child abuse at the discretion of the parent, a loophole for assault. This isn't just a silly, irrelevant thing that people haven't gotten around to changing either, like one of those silly laws about seeing a bird in the street or whatever. I want to look at 
a modern example. The West Virginia Bill HB 3018, presented on March 1st of 2023. It was a simple bill that prohibited the marriage of those under the age of 18 with or without guardian approval. I'll give you a positive breather and let you know that it did pass. So there's one nice silver lining to the situation. You know, better late than ever. But out of 97 votes, 13 elected representatives voted nay. I'm going to put their names and faces on the screen in case you live in or know people in the West Virginian area. These people who voted to perpetuate the underage bartering of children in perverted marriages at the guidance of their guardians. To put this in perspective, 90% of child abuse happens with someone they know and trust, and between 30 and 40% are done by a parent or close relative. So, yeah, let's give the people statistically most likely to abuse children the full reins on legally chaining the children to their adult captors. I would advise you do what you can to never let anyone you know vote for one of these monsters again. Important tangent aside, why do I drop this heavy brick all of a sudden? Well, because it is of critical importance to portray to children this type of sudden anxiety in a way that is not offensive. Portray a family-friendly version of this so that the child can recognize if they are in a similar situation and know that it's wrong. Realize that it's not their fault and tell another adult or try to get out of the situation before it escalates. Even in more tame cases, it allows children, especially people beginning a female puberty, that their feelings of anxiety and confusion are valid. That they didn't do anything wrong and that this is a part of growing up in the world as it is. So portraying characters suddenly treating Stevani differently and the slow, confused acknowledgement of that fact is really well bridged here, actually. The creators also avoid any sort of genuine, dark, or creepy subject matter by making the fusion physically an adult. Doing this makes it so the people and societal change doesn't turn everyone in Beach City into creeps for the sake of the narrative. It's a really smart way of threading the needle on this important subject without doing anything inappropriate for a TV Y7 production. That being said, most people, while treating Stevani differently, also don't do anything wrong. That is, until the party. This is the general feeling that they're trying to get across in this episode. Stevani gets hungry and goes and gets a donut. And Lars and Sadie are both flustered at Stevani's appearance, which leads into the idea of people treating you differently as you get older, especially depending on how you look and if they think you're attractive. This sort of pretty privilege that becomes a constant part of social dynamics regardless of you choosing to interact with it. While Stevani is happy to receive two free donuts, they are sad that Steven and Connie can't eat them next to each other, hence the title's name, Alone Together. They want to share the joy that they feel being with one another, but when each other's joy is now one being, the joy sharing their experience suddenly feels more lonely. Since Stevani, once again, is the manifestation of their relationship dynamic, not just two kids in a trench coat. Their adult appearance gets them invited to a rave, so they excitedly go and check it out. Check out the world that was previously not afforded to them. Getting to be cool, mature, invited into scenes that they otherwise haven't experienced. Something that most kids go through a period of wanting to do. They initially shy, start dancing at the rave. A nice callback showing how Steven is able to create spaces where Connie feels comfortable being herself. Emphasizing the way that their positive traits reinforce and support one another. After the initial dance, though, Stevani, unaware of the new social cues that come with an adult environment, suddenly start feeling anxious and insecure since they were having fun dancing, but now most other people have stopped dancing to watch them. It's once again bridging this gap metaphorically on the introduction of puberty. Kevin starts hitting on Stevani and dancing with them, but the sudden situation they find themselves in causes Stevani to anxiously run from the dance. Stevani starts turning over the idea of the dance, that they like dancing, so they should like this, but this dance is different. It's not fun. There's something else going on. Suddenly, something that they did innocently for fun has brought along with it a new sensual context just by virtue of them being in an older body. That nothing has changed about them, but the social stigma has recontextualized who they're allowed to be, and they don't have a grasp on this gap in social perspective. 
This is probably what Sugar meant when they referred to Stevani as the gap in social expectations that comes with a sudden puberty. The ways that expectations and things that you did start having different meanings just because of the body that you're now in that is changing without your choice. That fear to have to understand your place as you grow from one stage of life into another. It also is a smart parallel with the non-binary message, as in the same way that we readjust and re-understand changing gender roles as we age from child to adult on more mature physical forms, people of trans and non-binary identities have to deal with even more social stigma and intense hateful social roles forcing them into boxes that they don't feel comfortable in, and they get ridiculed and judged heavily when they try to stray out of it. Puberty, age, social and economic change, they all bring about heavily restrictive expectations on what you're supposed to be socially, how you're supposed to look, supposed to act, and a lot of times since these social rules are separate from science and stick to socialized, generalized traits, it leaves a lot of space for confusion and anxiety, especially for kids who are still trying to grasp life as it is. Kevin then starts coming on to them more strongly, gaslighting Stevani, which causes them to become more anxious, doing a sort of angry tantrum-like dance, which invokes more childlike mannerisms. This disjointed emotional tantrum is enough with the anxiety to defuse back into Steven and Connie. I think this tells a message that if you are not comfortable in a situation and feel pressure to because everyone else is doing it, or that's just what people your age do, that being a kid isn't actually a bad thing. Being comfortable is what's important. If you feel pressured to be someone you aren't, it's okay to be honest with yourself and say no, and it doesn't mean that you are of less value. As someone on the arrow A spectrum, a lot of sexual stuff gives me the ick. It makes me uncomfortable. And for a long time, I used to shame myself for not just growing up and doing what is expected of me, I remember initially having to learn what people found attractive about certain body parts because they either looked the same to me or disgusted me. And as I got older, that lingering disgust I felt towards many things made me feel childish and immature. This episode says, So you feel like a kid. Nothing is wrong with that. You don't have to do things that you don't want to until you're ready. And if you're never ready, that's fine too. And I think that is an overwhelmingly positive message for kids, and one that I think I wish I would have had growing up. In fact, if I hadn't avoided Steven Universe like The Plague the whole time that it was airing due to those really awful videos, it's possible I could have seen this episode in high school and, while feeling a little goofy, you know, being older than the target audience, still felt something more comfortable and happy about myself. Connie starts laughing and Steven seems to cry a little bit when he starts laughing too. It kind of shows that Steven actually may have been the more uncomfortable of the two, but that it's no longer an issue because they have each other. Ending with Connie happily dancing in front of everyone, knowing that they have each other's backs through thick and thin, this does so much to build upon the positive and negative traits that Steven and Connie have and emphasize how their relationship pulls out the best in each other. It's a genuinely great episode in my mind, and one of the smartest use of the gym parallels to broach important topics and positive lessons for children that we've seen so far. Episode 38 brings up the shame that Steven feels from the trip way back in episode 3 over forgetting to bring the Sea Spire statue, and this causes the gems to send Steven on a mission to prove his worth to himself and help with his insecurity. Brief note, but I've seen some people call his regret over this a retcon, since even the creators realized how bad he acted, but I'd like to clarify, a story giving additional context or building upon previously established events isn't a retcon just because you don't like it. The reasons retcons are considered bad is because they take factual things about the plot or characters and readjust them in ways that are logically impossible to reach different conclusions. Think how famously George Lucas changed who shot first in the scene with Han Solo to make it so Han shot last in self-defense. That's a retcon. Or say a character is established to have a fear of spiders, but in a later episode they talk about how they love spiders without connecting any reasons or implying how they changed their mind. A retcon is an irreconcilable inconsistency. If it can be easily explained away or does not contradict things specifically, it's not a retcon. Back to the show, though. Here Pearl tells him that the Sea Spire was a test all along, and that it wasn't important. This line can't be a retcon because Pearl is an unreliable narrator who's willing to lie for Steven's safety and security. So, the truth of the claim is largely irrelevant to the actual point of the episode. 
Second, even if it is true, and the positive things that were said back then were also true, the Sea Spire plays no role in warping, in gem fusion, or in creation, and has no lore or world-building ties to anything significant outside of that that happens later in the series. So there's no reason to believe that it wasn't both in disrepair and fairly unimportant to the greater scheme of things. Anyways, despite growing a lot as a person and in terms of powers, this episode is meant to drive home how the gems lie to protect Steven, but also how this comes from a place of love and hoping for the best. Steven discovers after failing the test that it's all fake. It's unfailable. Feeling lied to and deceived, but more importantly, feeling undervalued, he breaks out of the test and overhears the gems at the exit. They state that they need him to succeed, because keeping his confidence up is the best chance that they have at continuing to grow his powers, that they think it's best for him. But Amethyst states something that's one of her most emotionally honest moments in the series, that she feels that they're just really bad at this. The whole raising Steven thing, like they are failing him. Pearl can't control him, and he shouldn't be taking anything from Amethyst, that without Rose telling them what to do, they feel uncertain and directionless. This episode is a real thinker, as after hearing them, he decides to go through the puzzle like normal, and he doesn't tell them that he knows it's fake. He lies to them, just as they lied to him, and for the same reason. To make them feel more sure of themselves over something that doesn't matter broadly anyway. Imagine someone is bad at art and they feel discouraged. Do you tell them, yeah, you suck, give up? Well, of course not. You focus on the positive points and try to push them in the right direction, at least the best that you can. You do your best to help them. Still, the lying aspect of the episode sits in this sort of morally gray area that I like about this episode. It sort of leaves you thinking, but importantly for the viewer, it confirms that the infantilization towards Steven truly doesn't come from a place of undervaluing Steven as a person or as his own individual agent, but from them seeing the world in him and wanting him to do the best that he can. His speech as he butters them up at the end and his knowing smile when they can't see his face, a really solid episode from any perspective, in my opinion. And I talked about it in a lot more detail in my Easy Peasy response, so you can check that out if you haven't as well. As a standalone episode, this also is totally killer. Episode 39, Garnet officially reveals her future side ability, something that has been hinted towards with many of the previous appearances. Always being in the right place or being the first to show up, smiling instead of saying things when Steven lies to the gems, I tried to hint a few times until now in this analysis, maybe a few of you caught it but didn't realize before, the future sight is conceptualized as a tiny million streams pooling off into different decisions always coming into being or ceasing to be with the possibilities. This confirms in some aspect that free will exists in the world of Steven Universe. It also slightly nerfs Garnet's abilities so that there's room for a margin of error. The message of this episode is another really good one for kids, that even though life is dangerous and any freak accident could harm us, that we shouldn't be living in fear. That pain shouldn't stop us from enjoying the life that we've got. I mean, exercise caution, sure, but don't let yourself get so caught up in every unlikely possibility that you halt your life. It also ends with a really nice line that is a great takeaway for most contexts. There are so many things that can hurt you in this world. I shouldn't have let one of them be me. Episode 40, the show continues on where episode 36 left off plot-wise. Noting how the gems have been trying to figure out what to do with the repair bots, Amethyst being content to squash them, and Pearl wanting to examine them and also scared about the repairs returning. They finally come clean and state for the first time that the gems come from off-Earth, where invading and using other planets is kind of their M.O., but that his mom, Rose, and the other crystal gems as they are, stood against them and protected the Earth. The time scale, or even enemy scale, is kept vague at this point, but seemingly Steven is finally trusted with a few more of the answers about who his mom was, at least from the perspective of these characters. Amethyst doesn't like the anxiety that comes with this revelation, and when Pearl leaves Amethyst's name out of the gems that defended Earth, it leaves intrigue. Amethyst takes Steven to the kindergarten, where we get a better idea of the scale of the gems. We also heard Peridot mention that her mission was to restart the production of Earth's kindergarten, so suddenly the idea of hundreds if not thousands of gems being created and carved out of this dark spot gives an ominous atmosphere. Amethyst initially acts cheery, but it's clear that there's some simplicity and ignorance that she misses here. 
where she had a place, her own place, but she came out after everyone, so she was left alone with the rocks for a, in parentheses, long time, until Rose and the Gems finally found her. Gems live thousands of years, so a long time could have done a lot to her psyche. We also later learned that this was roughly 500 years. It introduces this idea of loneliness again that Lapis already brought up earlier. Amethyst is someone who is clearly hurt by the things that Pearl says a lot of the time, but chooses to double down and close herself off instead of confronting Pearl on this. A lot of times, Amethyst will do something natural to her, and in response to Pearl's disapproval, will then do the same thing on purpose just to make Pearl matter, and to prove that she is her own person. Alternatively, she sometimes chooses to slink away or pursue quiet time away from the other gems. Later in the series, we see that she has a more extreme avoidance to talking about herself and her feelings. Even this episode started with a typical slink-off that Amethyst does, only to be escalated after Pearl ridicules her at her most insecure, the place that she was born. This really emphasizes Pearl's continuous character flaw of being a fairly emotionally unintelligent character, not being able to read between the lines or understand people. Amethyst has an inferiority complex. Not being there for the gem war, never visiting Homeworld, left to clean up the mess that she didn't make and didn't ask for, I think it puts in a lot better context her fight-or-flight nature towards the others, but especially Pearl. At the start of the series, Steven resembles Amethyst more before growing into himself, but it's clear that she sees him as a sort of similar person to her, coming in after everything was seemingly solved, or where we were left picking up the pieces. Uninvolved with the troubles of the things that happened before, but forced to participate in some way or another. This is something that she also emphasizes more directly in Season 5. As allegory and message for prospective kids watching goes, this is likely supposed to mirror some aspects of a divorce. Pearl saying, you are the only good thing to come out of this mess, while well, standing in the place that Amethyst was born, and Amethyst's previous comment saying that she never asked to be born is something that I think a kid who had poor parents or grew up under different types of bad circumstances would need to hear and relate to. There are a number of other ways that you could apply it to something like a baby only one person wanted, but the other person comes to love as their own person. Letting the kid know that being the product of something bad doesn't make you bad. Sometimes it makes you the silver lining. Sometimes it even makes you a miracle. Some criticism I've seen is that Amethyst randomly drops and picks up this insecurity for no reason, and that this absence of its hyper-focus is somehow evidence of poor writing. But I hope I've laid out just across these first 40 episodes how this is patently not true and a terrible reading of the show. Just because Amethyst doesn't want to talk about her issues all the time or make a big deal of her deep-seated insecurity doesn't mean that her actions aren't obviously informed by this insecurity. This whole episode shines a light on where Amethyst's tendency to act out comes from in episodes like Tiger Millionaire, Steven the Sword Fighter, even her influence into Sugalite and Coach Steven. It explains her want to expose Pearl and not disappoint Garnet in Secret Team. It gives context to what fuels Amethyst's tendency to provoke Pearl through basically the whole show so far, and more so it mirrors the behavior that we see of children who face neglect in early life, who reflexively act out to be reprimanded, because the reaction, even a negative one, proves that you care about them. Instead of being ignored and left alone, alone like Amethyst was for the first many, many, many years of her life. Aside from this, people also seem to conflate character arc with character development. Characters can have big plot lines or plot moments where they make a stand and change for the better, but the more natural way to do this in a longer story medium is if the story is told with small strides and characterization changes that happen seamlessly over time. You can also get the best of both worlds and have small developments reaching to a warming point where you can jump off into a big push moment for the character. That's exactly what this episode was to the first 39 before it. Small character changes, little bits bubbling underneath, things pushing forward, and established emotional struggles playing as a backbeat to more central focuses until the buildup reached a boil. Then this change cools somewhat, not totally changing the norm, but causing a change in temperature to build more in the future. It's actually really, really 
thoughtful and intelligent and seamless how they cover Amethyst's arc, with someone who wants to avoid the fact that she has these issues and actively run away from it, and how they manage to intertwine this with the natural events of the story until she eventually has to make changes in her own life. Episode 41 establishes Sadie's interest in horror and all things spooky as they go to spooky movie night with Ronaldo. Lars is a killjoy as always and is obsessed with social perception. Supernatural stuff starts happening, Sadie gets along well with Ronaldo, and Ronaldo clearly is making some moves, which causes Lars to feel more insecure. Lars tries to get Sadie to abandon Ronaldo and Steven, but she won't, and gets swallowed by the house. Lars's name appears suddenly on the wall, and Ronaldo throws Lars into the mouth of the monster, hoping to get Sadie back. But instead, Steven saves the day. The gym projects a memory that shows Ronaldo's love of the supernatural and a lack of social awareness, and Lars's extreme social awareness and personal low self-esteem, causing him to rip up an embarrassing photo that Ronaldo took of him. It paints Ronaldo as this wide-eyed and well-meaning kid while hurting people from a lack of social awareness and perspective, and adds to Lars's characterization as his clout-focused need to be perceived as a cool guy attitude coming from this extreme sensitivity. Lars is someone very emotionally fragile and sensitive, so he hides his true self, what he sees as weakness, and seeks approval to guard himself against this pain. It's fine if you don't like Ronaldo or think he's gross or bad for this. I, I don't like Ronaldo, to be honest. Uh, I think he's funny uh, probably 20% of the time that he's in the show. I could probably explain why I think it's fine, but I just don't see this as something that would reasonably affect the way that you perceive the quality of the show overall. Like, some small side character does something kinda evil that amounts to nothing in the plot. That's like 80% of what Onion does in the story, too. Just doesn't seem too noteworthy. But I do think that this gives a greater context into the pasts and general characterization of these characters and how they've grown into the people that they are today. Episode 42, Steven and Connie want to stay together during a snowstorm, but Connie's family want Connie to get back before it starts. Garnet temporarily gives Steven future sight ability, and through trial and error, Steven learns to be responsible and realize even though sometimes he might want something, it's better to forego what he wants for what is right. At the end of the episode, his responsibility is also rewarded as the Mahesha Warrens let Steven and Greg stay over at their place during the storm. It's straightforward, and the antics are great. One of my favorite episodes of season one, but the point is honestly so tight that I don't have a ton to say. It's just another good episode for kids that says, even if you don't want to do something, sometimes doing something you don't want to do is what will make you be happier in the long run. One detail granted by one of the future site routes shown is that the Crystal Gems send off a bomb-like crystal to destroy other methods of space warp to keep Homeworld from making contact. In theory, to make it more difficult for Peridot to get back, but there could also be some additional plot buildup in the background, too. I don't know. It's still nice how all these hypothetical futures end up leading to Steven knowing a bunch of stuff he wouldn't know otherwise. Episode 43 centers around Greg needing to clean up his storage unit, so Steven brings Amethyst to help and Greg seems slightly uncomfortable. This isn't the first time he's seemed like this around her, either. During the cleanup, Greg picks up the picture of him and Rose that Steven accidentally broke in episode 2. That's right, for all this, a tiny, tiny callback. And Amethyst gives a look at the portrait, clearly feeling something, before going farther into the storage unit. This episode revolves around the relationship between Greg and Amethyst, as it's still trying to grapple with the loss of Steven's mom, Rose, and how sometimes people looking to cope can drag each other into a toxic cycle. Amethyst finds a TV show that Greg and Amethyst used to watch a lot before, especially after Rose left them, and they quickly fall into their old habits, neglecting their current duties to binge the show together. It doesn't seem like that big of a deal at first, but once they fail to show up for the fireworks show, Garnet and Pearl explain how they used to disappear for days at a time together, watching the show after Rose was gone. Steven, upset, goes to check on Greg and see what's up, and sees the moment that Greg hears the fireworks. Greg immediately realizes that he's let himself get too sucked into this show and tells Amethyst he's going to the fireworks show, but Amethyst stops him, saying they should stay here. Greg initially says that he needs to because he promised Steven, but after Amethyst says Steven's tough and he'll be fine, Greg says he wanted to see it. Amethyst takes this badly, as she clearly perceives Greg leaving her for the fireworks shows an emblematic sort of abandonment that she feels. 
this goes back to the exact issue that we were talking about with Amethyst and how she's trying to grow, but how she has this abandonment and insecurity over her own personal value. This, of course, picks up on that insecurity I talked about in episode 40 in a more significant and, instead, toxic way. When Greg says he needs to be there for his son, she asks, what about me? As if he has an equal responsibility to her after Rose left. She always had Rose, but Rose left her for Greg in her eyes, and then when Rose left, Greg and her were abandoned. They used each other to soften the blow. Amethyst normally acts out like this with Pearl, but Pearl is less bothered by things. Greg is just a normal person who's suffering. He doesn't have powers, he doesn't live as long as the gems, so as Amethyst says, he can be very sensitive. Greg has a especially large sensitivity to Amethyst's shape-shifting, as he's been shown to not really like gym stuff in general, and he tries to be cool with it, reminding her that it makes him uncomfortable, but Amethyst doesn't respect his boundaries. She's already stuck in this feeling of insecurity and abandonment, and instead uses this feeling to lash out at him like she normally does. Steven stops what's happening and takes the moment to try and bring attention back to the storage unit while also saying stuff that cuts pretty deep about how difficult it is to let go, but that keeping the mess around isn't the answer either. And Amethyst flees, embarrassed and ashamed as Steven saw her transformed as Rose. The next day, Steven and Greg go to the unit by themselves to find that the gems have already cleaned everything up. It was Amethyst's idea. This symbolizes the burying of the hatchet, I think. The metaphor of past baggage to the literal clutter of a storage unit is a really good way to visualize the message of this episode. I think this also implies a lot more than it shows. When Steven asks when Greg ever had a cat, or Greg's extreme emotional reaction to Amethyst transforming, as well as Pearl's insistence that they would disappear for days, it seems that they both may have tried to live as if Rose never left, wallowing in their sadness and denial together. It's a great episode, really heavy, surprisingly, but it also has funny moments, like Pearl's Happy New Year, Steven! How's my volume? Strangely enough, some people criticize this episode. Even a person replying to me on Twitter months ago, describing that one episode where Amethyst psychologically tortures Greg, and while that is a severe over-dramatization, I don't really get why this would be a criticism or fault of the show. It's very in line with Amethyst's struggles, gives great characterization to Greg in general worldbuilding, no one acts out of character, and the bad things that Amethyst does are clearly clearly portrayed as bad and punished by the show. It's something that actually knocks Amethyst out of this behavior as she becomes embarrassed that she would let herself act so poorly. In fact, I'm glad the writers were brave enough to explore the way that some of the character's flaws can manifest in toxic ways that hurt others, as well as the cycle of hurt people hurting people more out of defensiveness and insecurity. And the resolution is very knowing, a hopeful note in the moving on process. In general, a very heavy message that I think is great for kids. Episode 44, Connie introduces Steven to her favorite book series. It's sort of a side thing, but it becomes important in a later episode. This episode focuses more on Peridot's marbles coming to Earth, but this time they're bigger. After destroying them indiscriminately for presumably a few days or a few weeks, they listen to Steven and decide to follow it to see what it's up to instead, instead of having to destroy them for the rest of eternity. There they are led to the kindergarten. There's some good characterization for the gems and their reactions to arriving at the kindergarten that helps cement where their characters currently are in regards to their arcs, with Amethyst and Pearl both agreeing with each other on following it being a bad idea, and Amethyst wanting the big orb to mind its own business. Clearly showing how this is rubbing a little bit too close to her own insecurities and how she might not want to learn whatever there is to discover. It's a small moment, but it reinforces this idea that Amethyst runs from her insecurities rather than facing them. The ground creates an open platform and digs itself into an underground station where Peridot establishes a gym projection link with the control room of the kindergarten. Steven tries to reason with Peridot and in the process names some other humans on Earth. Sadie, Lars, Connie, Greg, who he just refers to as my dad, and the mailman, and Onion. This also seems small, but becomes a plot detail in a much later season that's very significant, as this is basically the only time that Homeworld has established a link with the Earth residents. The misunderstanding of Stevens being different evolved humans, and a few more things get across the idea that Homeworld, as high-tech as it is, 
is not just apathetic toward organic life on other planets, but lack a fundamental understanding of what life on other planets entail. It implies immediately wrongdoing via ignorance and apathy, rather than wrongdoing via understanding and apathy, which I think is a significant difference that will be slowly used to wedge leverage as the series goes on. It's the difference between a person killing another person and a person killing a fish, you know? This also confirms that Homeworld had thought all this time that Earth had been wiped of all of its gems, meaning that they didn't know even to this day that the corruption beam corrupted the gems rather than shattering them, and that the gems who were on Earth, the crystal gems, were protecting the Earth from all organic life being destroyed, and that some gems managed to still come out later like Amethyst. A whole ton of plot and world-building stuff is revealed here. They destroy the portal, and Peridot states that she is making a report back to Homeworld about her findings, it plays again on Steven's hopeful ignorance and the gem's overprotective one-sidedness. Steven fails to comprehend the gravity of the situation and acts recklessly because he does not understand the weight of this possibility. He does not understand the weight of this possibility because the gems don't trust him with the information he needs to reach an informed decision. Both of their flaws sort of perpetuate each other in a way that causes this event to happen, driving home this arc for Steven's character in the gyms as they eventually reach mutual understanding and respect Steven as he gets older and gains more competence. Episode 45 involves the gyms revisiting the cherry patch from Sirius Steven as they are more open about retrieving weapons from a long time ago at the gem war. Lion finds a scabbard and Pearl is immediately obsessive over it. Pearl decides to show Steven a place that Rose apparently only told Pearl of, and Pearl says a lot of weird stuff in this episode, talking about how many secrets that Rose kept to protect people, and saying how important it was for a leader to keep secrets to protect others, while also clearly reveling in being told what the others weren't. It's clear that she's kind of fluffing Rose's attitude to make it sound nice, but in actuality, the reason she likes it is because she likes being swept up and feeling like Rose thought she was the most special one. Then it turns out that the place that Pearl was taking Steven to that took them literally hours was the place that Connie and him went to on accident in episode 17 with Lion. The discovery that Lion was also Rose's, but Pearl had no knowledge of it, makes her suddenly feel insecure and outside of Rose's vision. This insecurity causes Pearl to have an outburst and go into denial. It's obvious that Pearl loved Rose, not as a leader or as a friend, but as a person above all others. Steven tries to catch up with Pearl on the battlefield using Lion, and while she runs with the sword, it once again reflects visually what is happening metaphorically in this scene. The Lion representing the parts of Rose that she did not know, chasing her down and forcing her to recognize them. Steven himself also somewhat representing this as Rose abandoned her to become him, and she doesn't understand him as a half-human. Pearl running away with Rose's old sword that she hasn't used for thousands of years, representing the simpler, more straightforward Rose that she knew and fell in love with. This is notable because Rose spent a lot longer with the gems after the gem war, as we learned earlier. So, this sword wouldn't represent who Rose was, but the ideal Rose that Pearl chose to remember. The one that she was praising without nuance before herself feeling excluded. This is already working in themes of Pearl being a biased and unreliable narrator. When Steven falls chasing after Pearl, she freaks out immediately, but once she sees him safely holding onto the roots, she chooses to leave him to hang and recover himself. She mentions again how sometimes Steven looks, sounds, just like her. How it's painful. She asks in vain if he has any of Rose's memories. She replays a memory of when Pearl vowed to stay at Rose's side to protect the Earth. How she was fine doing that because Rose would be there. Fine not ever returning home in exchange for being by her side. Rose also refers to her as my Pearl, which is a term of endearment, but also a plot detail later. Pearl also, almost word for word, says lines that will eventually become some of her lyrics in Do It For Her in the upcoming episode 58 in the sixth episode of season two. Stephen hugs her and tells her that he thinks that she's pretty great, and symbolically resolving this conflict, she spends time with Stephen as he fetches things from Lion. Stephen learns more about his mom, and Pearl starts to come to grips with the parts of Rose that she never knew, something that will continue as a large part of Pearl's character arc going on. 
Some people criticize the show and Pearl as trying to kill Steven in this episode, which is again both not a criticism of the quality of the show, but a character, and also an exaggeration and mischaracterization of that character. Pearl wanting to be left alone, running away, she showed concern whenever she thought that Steven was in danger, but once she thought that he was fine, she let himself figure it out. It's cold, maybe a little cruel, but it embodies how Pearl was feeling and emphasizes again this toxic side of her hurt left after Rose in a similar way to Amethyst in episode 43. I think people also conflate characters doing unlikable or questionable things to characters having poor writing, and this is an extremely obvious different thing. Someone can be a great character and a bad person, or a great person but be a bad character. Pearl acts very sensibly within her characterization, while giving us a more nuanced and emotionally mature look at her character here. I don't see the issue. We just have to know that she's flawed. Normally, people are begging for this type of nuanced characterization. But once again, a really good episode for her character. Episode 46, Greg's passion for music becomes relevant as the Wailing Stone seems to be sending a message from space. The gyms initially doubt that Greg could actually do anything, but learn to respect him as he figures out the frequency is actually a video, not audio, and decodes the message with Steven's help, and a little faith in him. This both serves as a good moment to realize Greg's practical positive traits and knowledge of the world, something that the gems have trouble grasping, and as a tender moment showing him how Steven's faith in his dad and encouragement can cause him to do greater things. This will also be emphasized later, whenever initially talking to Peridot about the rain, how he's only learned these things from his dad. The plot important part is that Lapis tells everyone Peridot is coming back to Earth, and she's not alone. And also that Homeworld is far more advanced than it was thousands of years ago when Lapis and the other gems last saw it, how it feels unfamiliar. Everyone panics at the hopelessness, but Garnet brings them back, pretending to be relieved and telling everyone they did it. They decoded the message. This is a really good message in handling problems in general. When things seem insurmountable or hopeless or overwhelming, don't discount the small victories and the parts of the puzzle that you're able to complete. When you start to enter a panic spiral, focus on what you can do right now and what you've already achieved. It doesn't help to wallow in despair. Just do what you can and let that keep your spirits up. You'll deal with these other issues as they come to pass. There's no use worrying over things that are yet to happen that you can't change. Just focus on the things you can. It's a very mature thing and really emphasizes how Garnet leads the Crystal Gems to be better in the face of adversity. Both a good episode for progressing Greg's characterization, the general character of the Gems as a whole, of furthering the plot, and also positive lessons for kids. Episode 47, Pearl designs a robot disruptor to destroy any of Peridot's robonoids to hopefully make things easier for whenever she arrives. But when Pearl tests it out, the device is so powerful that it wipes out all the power in Beach City and barely even stuns the small robot. This helps to build a sense of scale in terms of how advanced and powerful Homeworld has truly gotten. If Pearl can wipe out entire cities of power but barely scratch a very small robonoid, it's a daunting implication. Stephen tries to help May or Dewey calm the citizens of Beach City. Dewey lies to them to keep them calm, something that he says is, you can't control what happens in the world, but you can control how people feel about it. It's a strange line because he is measuring the feeling of safety of the people of Beach City against their own interests, but it's not in this case for an entirely bad faith reason. Truth is, people don't know what is going on, but keeping them in the dark, literally, pun intended, is going to leave them more exposed when danger does come. Steven starts to realize how wrong this is as his dad refuses to take a glow stick, believing Dewey at his word. And then immediately after, we hear the gems whispering about what they're going to do when Peridot comes, whispering as to not have Steven over here. Dewey to the city mirrors the gems to Steven in a lot of ways, keeping them in the dark for their own good, so to speak, not realizing that them being in the dark also leaves them unprepared and defenseless. Maybe the gems think that they can just protect Steven forever regardless, but it's proven in the past not to be a good thing to underestimate him. The gems refuse to tell him what's going on and to go inside and play cards, but Steven lags behind and sees them talk anxiously again amongst themselves. 
Stephen realizes that they don't feel comfortable sharing what's going on with him, but that what's going on is important, so he goes on a walk, just to see the town mobbing around Dewey. He gives a rousing speech saying that Mayor Dewey was lying to them because he wanted to protect them, even if it was misguided. He realizes the parallel and goes back to the gyms. He tells them that he realizes they just don't want him to be scared, but he wants to know the truth. He needs to, and Garnet finally opens up about them being scared of what's coming, how they do feel weak, like they may not be able to protect him. And when the episode ends, he says, they've been scared before, but they can figure out what comes next together. The light returns then immediately to Beach City. This episode is super cinematic and takes itself very seriously in a way that makes a lot of sense to the characters, as well as resolving most of what has been this season's arc between the Jims and Steven. Steven growing from ignorance and carefree compassion to competence and willful empathy. He has been proving his competence and maturity over the course of the season more and more regularly as the season has gone on, and is now someone who wants to be relied on, not just someone who relies on others. But now it's time to prove it. Episode 48, the show starts casually getting the bits from the Fryman place, and Petey is running the shop all by himself, showing how far he's come from the sniveling and wanting of his dad's acceptance in episode 5 to the mature person that he is handling the business on his own. Greg says, Wow, that's a lot of responsibility for a kid your age, which feels like a mirror for the responsibility that Steven has also grown into over this season, almost without us even realizing it. Suddenly, as the conversation continues and a hand appears out of the sky, a callback to Episode 2's light cannon, but again, to drive home the scale of the threat, the cannons have no effect. Stephen calls Dewey to evacuate the town, and while doing so, Greg and the Jims have decided that Stephen will evacuate with Greg while they deal with the threat. But they don't bother telling him beforehand because they know that he won't like that. Garnet gives Stephen a speech about protecting the people of Beach City with his powers and needing to pull the residents together so that they can escape the city safely. Stephen seems to buy it initially, even though obviously the true and full intent of Garnet's words, despite somewhat meaning what she's saying, is to keep Stephen safe. And we see that as after Stephen leaves, immediately the gems are clearly distraught. It seems that they have accepted that this will almost certainly end in failure and death, and that this is their final stand after thousands of years of trying to liberate Earth as they could. Steven hopefully thinks maybe Peridot will change her mind once they see how nice everyone on Earth is, but reluctantly, Greg says, the other gems aren't like his mother. They are aliens who came to Earth. They were going to eat up every last bit of life for their own goals, and it was only his mother and a minority of other gems who were able to fight them off. Steven says that it was still good that she fought and saved the Earth, but Greg says there's no such thing as a good war, that countless gems and people died, that only her few close friends could survive behind her shield. Greg decides to have faith in Steven after a lot of back and forth, and Steven returns to protect them, since he realizes he is the one with Rose's shield now. After all, the only reason Pearl or any of them are still even here is because Mom's shield protected them all before. He calls Connie, but she doesn't pick up, so he leaves a message, a possible last to Connie, trying to stay positive, but fill her in on the reality of the situation. Lion teleports him back, and he sees Opal firing at the hand. Again, this emphasizes the desperation of the gems, as Pearl and Amethyst rarely stand completely on a united front without bickering as established throughout the whole season. They operate now without hesitation, but it's still not enough. We get the introduction of Jasper, which is portrayed with a get over here, grabbing Lapis by the wrist and pulling her forcefully. She can't talk back, subservient to Jasper's demands, and this immediately paints the dynamic as allegorical to an abusive relationship. Jasper immediately knows what she's looking at. She calls Pearl defective, Amethyst puny, and overcooked, and Garnet a shameless display. In retrospect, we know this is because Garnet is a fusion, but for now, that's just a hint. It's also another thing to mention that some people try to claim that Garnet is hiding her representation from the rest of the world, but forget that in every single instance Garnet is ever seen by a new gem, they immediately know that she's a fusion of two different types, and either meet her with disgust or embrace her with acceptance. Lapis insists Steven is harmless in an attempt to protect him, but Jasper takes it as him being weak and not worth considering, so they plan to blast the gems away with the ship. 
Steven saves them with his shield, proving his competence and cementing that he too can be relied upon, even in saving all their lives. Jasper, upon seeing Rose Quartz's shield, insists that Yellow Diamond needs to see whatever Steven is, calling him a thing. This is the first mention of Yellow Diamond proper in the story as a grand authority figure of some kind. Jasper poofs Garnet, and two gems fall instead of one. Everything should definitely be clicking now. Jasper still believes Steven to be Rose, and they are captured. Episode 49, Jailbreak. Steven awakes to a voice singing that in retrospect we know to be Sapphire, and the melody to be the iconic Stronger Than You song that will play later in the episode. Steven also says the names of the gems, then remembers Garnet, showing a red and blue gem for a moment. Steven hears some exasperated groaning and discovers that he can get through the wall blocking him in. The design that shows up on him as he does it is the same that poofed Garnet. We imagine that Steven can't poof because his form isn't linked to gem power. If the gem destabilizer is made to temporarily zap the power of gems, Steven will broadly be unaffected aside from his gem power being suppressed, so he will be able to escape with only some discomfort. This also kind of calls back to the insecurity that Steven had of only being half Jim and not being able to help. Now he sees that him being half Jim actually lets him help in ways that others can't. Steven finds Ruby, who is seemingly making the noises, and Ruby sees him back and says, this is just great, and tells him not to look at her. We know this retroactively is because Ruby and Sapphire were going to introduce themselves as a surprise for Steven's next birthday, but that the surprise has been ruined, which is a really cute way of showing the way that Ruby's brain works, even in a situation as stressful as this. Ruby hears Sapphire singing and says her name and then asks to let her out. Steven does so with little hesitation, seeing as Ruby was trapped and seems to be worried for her friend. Ruby tells Steven that she can't see, grabbing her head, another implication that it's been so long since Ruby and Sapphire were separated that she's having trouble not trying to use the future vision again. Next they see Lapis, and she tells them not to save her because she's already caused too much trouble and that Homeworld is going to decide what to do with them. She clearly has resigned herself to her own fate, and is hoping that she will not be shattered if she is compliant. She's been crushed, imprisoned, after all she wanted to do was return to Homeworld and be normal, Homeworld wasn't the home that she knew it as. An iconic exchange between Lapis and Steven is, they hurt my friends. That's why we can't fight them. No, that's why we have to fight them. Some people see this as a contradiction to Steven's later character, but I think that most people with basic comprehension of the situation know that he doesn't mean that we have to kill all of them because they hurt my friends. He means we have to resist their ideology. We have to stop them from the hurt that they are causing. Still, Lapis resigns herself to her fate, not being convinced. This further characterizes her in this Stockholm Syndrome type of way, or more accurately, I think, maybe BWS, or Battered Woman Syndrome. BWS is a relationship-specific type of learned helplessness, where the victim of abuse eventually internalizes their suffering as their own fault, and lacks the motivation, or hope, to leave their current situation, seeing it as hopeless. Sometimes they even fight attempts to save them from their own situation because of a fear of anxiety and terror of what will happen to them if they step out of line. Obviously, Jasper is not Lapis's girlfriend or anything, but that seems to be the type of relationship dynamic that they're building here with this allegory. Next, Steven hides while Peridot and Jasper are talking, and Peridot briefly mentions checking the cluster. This is the first mention of it. Jasper again emphasizes calling Steven Rose Quartz. This, along with the obvious ignorance of Peridot in the previous episodes in regards to organic life, implies that the situation with Steven is very rare and unknown, or perhaps has never happened before. He represents his Jim's personality in the story, sure, but the chaotic element, uncertainty, possibility, freedom, and change. Steven sets Sapphire free, Garnet refuses, and Steven leaves for Amethyst and Pearl. Now we have one of the peak moments in the show. I'm sure people don't really need me to explain what is important or cool about this scene, so I'll try to be quick. Jasper states confusion at the idea of them refusing, seeing fusion as a cheap trick to make weak gems artificially stronger. Too much stress or distraction often causes diffusion, as we've seen. As we will see, fusion is also just used as a means to up a group's power for utility purposes, like rubies forming into a larger ruby. 
When two different gems fuse together, though, they aren't merely more of the same spectrum of personality traits, it becomes a mix of the positives and negatives. Depending on the personality, from practical sense, the strengths can cover the previous weaknesses. Most importantly, though, when a fusion is done over a deeper, more secure bond, a mission statement far more vital than attack this or do this job, the ability to hold together is also strongly negated. Through the way that fusion works, it emphasizes many of the core ideas of the show. The value of people, the value of stable and healthy relationships, and the value of being willing to be vulnerable, honest, open, and rely on each other. Fusion is the string of the relationship, the tether, the push and the pull, and Garnet is fused all the time, because the strength of trust, honesty, and love is solid enough to hold without stammer. Jasper only sees fusion as power and utility, and this will ultimately be her downfall, both for this fight and for the future. Peridot manages to use the escape pod to escape back to Earth, the ship crashes, but Steven's bubble protects the gems from the landing explosion, once again saving their lives. Jasper decides the only reason that she lost was because of the utility of fusion, and again grabs Lapis by the wrist, calling her a brat, leaning in further to this consistent depiction. You can't totally force gems to fuse, you need an ideal to hold onto, a similarity between the two, but it's important to see how Lapis is trapped here. Even though Lapis' first response is to try escaping, it fails, burning in that learned helplessness. It probably gives her time to realize that she never had a chance to escape or be free, that Homeworld was almost certainly going to shatter her, or in the very least, not respect any free will or growth that she's experienced over the thousands of years of suffering that she had been left in the mirror. Especially after this failure. If she fights the gems, she'll probably be bubbled for who knows how long if they win, trapped again. Plus, she doesn't even want to fight them, similar to her time in the mirror. If she sides with the gems, her death is sealed, it's just a matter of time. Considering how few the numbers and how primitive the technology of the crystal gems too. There's really no way out except for her to hide. But she still does want to protect Steven, as a thank you, as a return of favor. Seemingly the only one who gave her the freedom to make her own choice, even when it could have backfired on him. Who literally made it so she could fly again, which is a great use of literal and metaphorical storytelling. So Jasper and Lapis fuse, but it's a hideous monster, signified by the toxic relationship dynamic that they have. But let's go into this dynamic. Lapis is blue and Jasper is yellow. Yellow is weak to blue, logic and practicality, and emotion meaning that Lapis has some hold on Jasper's side. Beyond that, what exactly are they fusing on? What's the connecting trait? We saw that Opal has trouble fusing in most cases because of how different Amethyst and Pearl are, but they're able to come together over the concept of protecting Steven. It's exactly what Jasper said earlier in the fight with Garnet. It's a utility and a means of power, a strength not had alone. Jasper cares more about power than anything. It informs her entire worldview and the idea of worth and value. She gets drunk on power, on ability. So that's what Lapis and Jasper fuse over. Lapis needs more power to protect Steven. She needs more power to protect herself, and she needs power so she's not stuck being helpless all the time. It's something that she also lusts after. Anything to have the utility to achieve her goal. They fuse over this idea of needing and wanting and desiring power, and since the power is so fundamental to Jasper, she can't easily dismiss this feeling and defuse, as it's quite literally fighting against her core ideals and belief about the world. Her belief that might makes right, that the strong have the right to rule over the weak, is her own downfall. Once again, though, Malachite is her own person in some sense. She is the fusion of these two extremely different gems held together by an obsession for power. She, as one gem, is no longer the two, but the symbol of their self-hating relationship. If the relationship between Lasper and Japis is spite-filled and self-hating, and based on a willingness from feeling things that are trapped and hopeless, then that will manifest in one as a self-hating powerful gem who feels its existence is a prison. The Lapis part of the personality then traps them under the sea. The Jasper part disagrees, but not enough to sacrifice her lust for power, and so they're pulled into the ocean. It's also a continued look at how Lapis often feels trapped, but in the process traps herself. Like we saw with her refusing Steven's help, literally opting to give up and remain in the cage. She was the one keeping herself there because she believed no matter what she did or where she went, she would end up 
in a cage, if not worse. It's also notable that Fusion leans green, of course following through with what happens in the mix of yellow and blue, a gym goal focused, held back by emotional hesitance. Finally, Garnet states the obvious, that they are bad for each other, and Steven receives a call from Connie, Steven being at a loss for words. Episode 50 picks right up where it left off with Steven promising to call Connie back since he sees his dad. Happy to see his dad, he fills him in on what happened, but as supportive and proud as Greg is, the danger that he knows his son is in now gives him an anxiety attack that he tries to get his nerves under control from, but fails. This causes Steven to then hesitate and reconsider telling Connie about the situation, as he doesn't want her to go through what Greg is. Steven tries to think of what to tell Connie, but as he continues walking around the ruins of Beach City, the weight of the danger he is in becomes less and less avoidable. Stepping on the broken glass, tripping over the ship parts, and seeing the flames and debris all around. Ronaldo, giving bad advice as usual, talks about being strong enough to protect the people from the weird things of this world that could hurt them. That quote-unquote ordinary people fear the cold facts of reality. He talks about the sacrifices one makes to lead and help for things we find ourselves in. And clearly Steven, who deeply cares about Connie, doesn't want her to go through this stress, or worse yet, be in danger herself. The thing he fails to realize here, though, is it's never your place to decide for others what they can and can't handle. Only they can, at least assuming you're equals. Everyone gets to choose who they can stand by and care about, and if you are refusing reaching out from fear that they will cling to you, it's their right to cling or not, and they have a right to know. That's the message the show leans on as this old hat fake macho decision shows Steven that it only actually hurts people to leave them in the dark. This also mirrors with how Steven was feeling with the gyms and how Beach City's residents were feeling towards Mayor Dewey. With Connie wondering if she had done something wrong since he won't explain, or why he's avoiding her. He says that he just wanted to protect her and that she did nothing wrong. She just said, stop. It's ridiculous on the face of it. From a historical perspective, it's nice to consider what this says about historical gender roles as well. The idea of the man needing to make decisions, stay stoic and emotionless, and protect girls and women is true to the point that everyone should do their best to protect each other, but to the extent that men undermine women's personal agency and the idea that they know what's better for them is a long-held standard for gender roles in media, and an incredibly sexist one at that. This is the first touch to say the relationship that Connie and Steven has is not dictated by their perceived gender, or at least Connie isn't going to let herself be treated as delicate and soft in that way. It's a small thing, but it's a good bit of representation for kids to know that each person can make their own decisions, that one gender or sex can't do certain things and one can, and one shouldn't have the right over the other, just because of how they were born. We're all humans. Connie opens up with empathy and asks that he share his feelings, seeing how hurt he is. Being relieved that he was able to be open and honest with her and ready to be relied on, they make up. This is also a good subversion of gender roles. Instead of playing the macho, stoic piece of garbage, he ends up being honest and treating her with equal respect. Greg shows back up to pick him up, and he's now calmed himself down. Then... They go back to cleaning up the town and getting back with their lives. We get some happy shots of the city folks, almost acting like nothing happened. A show that humanity will always thrive, even when we think that the situation may seem hopeless. Episode 51, Connie and Steven are back hanging out after the events of the last episode and talking about the book series that she introduced him to in episode 44. This episode, as I talked about in the prelude, is sort of a meta-commentary on the different types of media appreciation, with Steven being happy that the book series ended happily, and Connie being upset that with all of these tropes that she was happy it subverted, they ended up dropping the anti-authoritarian messaging for a happy ending with a wedding. A funny scene in retrospect, with how Steven Universe itself ended, and how people tend to react to it. Something Connie says is, Unlike art, reality can't always win against the iron chains of authority, which says a lot about Steven's own character and the show itself. Connie's idea of authority comes from her strict unlistening parents and the endless rules, and it also gives some leeway that, yeah, sometimes reality is too complicated for any happy ending, but art allows us to see an ideal to strive towards, something to fight for. That's what Steven ends up saying at the end of the episode. How even if it was cheesy, he loves when characters he loves and the good things they fight for end good. 
because they deserve that. And both of these wants for realism and for idealism are still valid in art. Before Stephen tells her his feelings, he wishes that he could give her a new ending. But that's not the plot of the episode. Before he's able to tell her these feelings at the end of the episode, they enter Rose's room to give her a different ending. But unintentionally, he wishes for Connie to be a certain way, creating a fake Connie who always does what he wants. The lesson additionally here is that even when people you like disagree or act in ways different than your expectations or wants, that a person with place to make their own choices is always better than a person who blindly follows and agrees with you. It's about valuing our different perspectives as people, our differences as a whole. The show also, in making him confess that he liked the book, portrays Connie in a wedding dress and says he likes her. So between the blushing and caring and obvious imagery of the episode, the last and a few other sparing moments of the show have been slowly and softly confirming their feelings for each other to be romantic in some regard, even if they don't necessarily feel the need to make things official or change their dynamic. They like each other, as friends, as people, as reliable partners in crime, and maybe more. It's wholesome, but also places a clear trajectory for where they will go through the rest of the series. Episode 2, Cleanup Continues of the Ship, and Pearl mentions again that they will continue to search for Peridot. Steven goes to hang out with the teens, introduced earlier on when the teens talk about everything that they've been through recently. Steven opens up, and all of them are super supportive and stunned by his sudden maturity. As Steven says that he feels like he can't talk to the gems about his issues because he's afraid they partially blame him for his mom not being around. Something we've seen alluded to through the entire season, with him trying to live up to her expectations. The gems love Steven, obviously, and they respect Rose's decision. But if they had to pick one or the other, he's pretty sure they'd go with Rose. He doesn't blame them if that's true, either. It just kind of sucks to feel. Then they see glowing in a cornfield and Steven, with some slight pressure, gets stuck inside of Peridot's machine, which is now empty. The teens have the best intentions, of course, with trying to make him feel relaxed and better, but his gut feeling and responsibility was right this time. The gems arrive and unknowingly attack Steven, but thanks to the teens, stop in time. The gems learn to treat Steven a bit more like an equal, and also have some slack on him, as Steven is affirmed in having should have gone to them immediately about finding the aircraft. It's a sort of double message. Relaxing is sometimes important, and if you don't get to, it could affect more important things. Or something. So that was season one, but we aren't done yet. There's an important aggregating of the analysis to be done here that we have to go through to hopefully not just let this completely roll off like water. Obviously, there's no way that I could summarize everything that I said over two and a half hours, but still, to many of you who like Steven Universe, your impression may have been to glaze over and enjoy the video casually. It may have sounded largely like summary, and it is a higher level of summary than I like to go into if you've seen my other videos, but it's important to engage with the things that I choose to summarize and choose to point out and then make comment on. This is because systematically, in about the most thorough way possible, I was able to prove on a moment-to-moment -moment basis that the accusations long levied against the show's characters and their arcs are full of it. Steven Universe paces characters extremely thoughtfully, and I know it's hard to keep two and a half hours of analysis straight in your head, so I've done even more of the legwork. I'm about to do something psychotic. Take a look at this graph, and this one, and this one. There's more. These graphs allow one to visualize, in my mind, every important character moment and detail. Every bit of foreshadowing, world-building, and significant characterization changes. One should note that this is not every time a character appears. There are countless episodes with the Crystal Gems that I have excluded one or more of the cast from, from the chart. No, 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 no. To get on these graphs, the only appearances being counted are ones that further the viewer's understanding of the character and their arc. The rose icon is a stand-in for Rose's characterization, primarily through others, since obviously she's not even alive. This does not include everything to do with Rose, though. Notably, I don't put her on episode 17 and many others where the armory is first discovered or where they go somewhere that was once Rose's. 
The only reason I would include Rose's characterization in an episode like that is if we actually further understood who Rose was as a person due to this. Things like that, and of minor characters who do not have major arcs in the first season, are classified as world-building, generally. Foreshadowing refers to something that explicitly ties in with later episodes of the season or series, something that's important to know for context. So, for example, I counted the mentioning of Homeworld early on as world-building, but not as foreshadowing, because early on, we're not given a large reason to believe that things will escalate to that level, at least until Lapis makes it seem like a possibility at episode 25 and 26. The only episode of season one that does not include foreshadowing, world-building, character progression, or a good lesson for kids, in my mind, is episode 33, Garnet's Universe. This is the only episode that I think fits the correct usage of the term filler in the story. But let's run through a few of the great arcs that we slowly piece together over these hours. Amethyst argues with Pearl. Then we see her creativity. We see her insecurity as a younger Jim, not there to fight on Homeworld. We see her abandonment from Rose and being found in the kindergarten. We see how this denial causes her to act out on the very ones that she seeks acceptance from, and eventually an effort to try and become better. Although this is all still season one, we don't get the solution. We see her running from her flaws, trying to bury them, but repeatedly being confronted forcefully. We see Pearl's efficiency and accuracy melt into emotional immaturity, incapable of truly accepting and grasping onto these concepts that she clearly doesn't understand, but shielded by her own insecurity to be seen as a smart person. A person who drives their own ideas. Someone who knows things. We see this facade of superiority slowly unraveling with the grieving process around Rose as she desperately wants to find use when even Stephen grows to rely on her less and less throughout the show. We see Garnet's seemingly calm, collected nature crack multiple times as she becomes transfixed on her future side, weighed down in the fusion from her ruby side, and slowly shown to not always have everything together but for the sake of Amethyst and Pearl, be placed in a position of strength that she didn't necessarily choose. We see Garnet fail, make misjudgments, and live with the guilt as she feels that she was trusted to guide the gems forward, but is just as confused as everyone else is. We see Greg first appearing almost slobbish and disorderly, but eventually seeing him as a loving father, willing to put him in harm's way for his son, or take Stephen out of it if he sees it's the best way to keep his son safe. We see some of his grieving process and his insecurity over the person who found him so wonderful not being around anymore, and him slowly earning the respect of the gyms as he helps them receive crucial info from his place of expertise essentially starting to bridge the gap in a relationship that was all but severed after Rose left. We grow to understand this vague idea of Rose as someone who found innate value in the ability to change, something so beautiful that she fought Homeworld and gave up her own life so that she could hope to become able to change. We saw her care for Stephen, but also her reluctance to share any of herself personally with the others fully, showing a different side to Greg, to Amethyst, to Garnet, to Pearl, with the realization that Pearl was like all the others deeply hurting her and leading her into denial. We are drawn to question her motives and reasons for her secrets, as we are given piecemeal characterization differences from character to character, that give context of what is ultimately a person not around anymore to be known fully. We see Stephen move from an incompetent, bright-eyed child, burdened by guilt over the ways that he is incapable of living up to the height of responsibility of his mother. We see him act recklessly to affirm that the gems love him, then see him double down and try to look away when he fails, forced to confront his inexperience with the world and his inability to be helpful. Slowly, we see Stephen work on that, going from a true child, incapable of most anything, babied by the gems, to someone while prone to missteps, can ultimately be trusted and relied upon as a member of equal usefulness as the rest of the gems, even saving their lives multiple times. We see Connie go from a friendless loner, crushed by her parents' expectations with no dreams, to someone with personal initiative, someone who fights for what she wants and pursues things she finds important. We see her insecurity over not being good enough to be Stephen's friend turn into the self-esteem to call Stephen out and explain why he wouldn't want to be her friend. And on and on and on. 
We get endless messages of how to embrace who you are, how to handle emotionally complicated situations, and how to give mercy and grace to yourself and others. This is the point of Steven Universe. All of this, and even more that I left out to not make this video infinitely long, let this make it hopefully more difficult for people to spread lies about mischaracterization and plot and filler when the proof is now all laid bare, in excruciating, possibly boring detail. This took forever. Please subscribe to my Patreon, become a channel member, or give me a Kofi. This is my full-time job, and boy does it take work. Season 1 is by far the most episodic of the show, especially in the first half. But again, like Adventure Time and many other shows to come after, lore details and important plot beats are spread out casually that build into these big moments. Characterization is established, then played with, individual dynamics are explored, You've got one episode for pretty much every major character introduction, and a lot of characters are even established in tandem with others, so there's rarely just a few characters being expanded upon at once. Take one of Lars's first character progression episodes. It also includes the vital introduction of the three main teen characters who eventually found Sadie Killer and the suspects in Season 5, and the episode also ties into major lore about Rose and her garden. It also, also doubles as an episode where Steven and Lars learn something different. Lessons that are both good for kids. So, you're seamlessly exploring five characters and expanding on world building and major lore with two great messages for kids intertwined in one 10 minute episode. There are some episodes in season one that don't offer much on their own, but these are almost always added upon in later episodes, making their seemingly more missable notes more important in retrospect. Episodes I think fit this are episode 5, episode 15, and episode 31. The amount of callbacks, small connecting details, and slight foreshadowing can't be underestimated. I have mainly just covered what are in the episodes so far, though, and how they connect in terms of a writing perspective, rarely giving my opinion on if I particularly liked or disliked an episode with pretty few exceptions. Because my main goal with this video is to show the smart ways that the story is structured and layered, something constantly completely ignored or misrepresented by its critics. And would you believe me, after this, that while some of Season 1's episodes are my favorite, it's actually my least favorite season overall. I hope you're on board. I want to work on dispelling the myth that Steven Universe went downhill. Because I think by far the weakest episodes of Steven Universe are most prominently featured in season one. Other than Onion Gang. Onion. So subscribe, turn on the bell, or whatever else. Join the Discord. I don't plan on making my next video the Season 2 video, although I desperately want you to support whatever I put out next, and I hope that you will trust that it will be of similar quality. It's also good to know how many people are willing to support this series, though. So leave comments, support me financially, and I will keep prioritizing it likewise. Thank you. I don't need you to respect me, I respect me. I don't need you to love me, I love me. I just want you to know you could know me if you change your... If you change your mind. If you change your mind.